everybody. Yo, it's the inaugural yeah. broadcast from Diamond Club Studios, deep in the heart of the Seven Acre Wood, located on Austin City Limits, former cult compound and nudist colony. Hello, beautiful people. I can't believe it. Yeah. What was what? The beautiful dream, Brian. Now is it's science a science fact. Is a science fact. Look at this. Uh, although really, uh, in terms of the, the, the picture as of now, it just kind of looks like you've actually regressed. Yeah, it a, looks a, it looks more like uh, the way it does. It looks like I'm sitting in the corner of the old studio. That's amazing. And then, yeah, because it used to be you used to have this super dead on shot where your like head was almost splitting the BB. Right. And then it went to the more off angle shot. And so now this is like a, a, a pre Bryce uh, uh, era of of uh, all of all this ever. You were still doing the switching. But look at this, a gigantic studio that as of literally seconds ago, friends, is functional. Yeah, dude. Hey, uh, we almost we almost had some big trouble because on Thursday and Friday, like three people independently were like, hey, have you had a have you had any weird things where the Internet just sort of stops for a second there? I'm like, oh, I did. I uh, you have too. And then we, we piece our stories together and it's like. Pretty much every 90 minutes on the nose, the internet would just stop. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. uh, on Friday, I called thinking like, Ugh, this one's going to be close. But instead, they uh, uh, credit to Spectrum, they came out at 6 p.m. on a Saturday, and uh, they did all the tests. They said, we can't understand why this is happening, uh, so we're just going to replace the cable modem. So there is an outside chance if everything drops, then, then my guess is they didn't fix it. But, fingers crossed, so far... Everything's everything's been running great. Yeah, we did a stream that night uh, for about three, three and a half hours, which went without a hitch, as far as I can tell. Oh, that's great. Uh, and uh, using all the computers have been way, seemed way smoother than when we were setting everything up. Uh, so yeah, you know, just uh, getting acclimated, trying to get everything all the way over here and solve for things that aren't you know uh, solved yet. Yeah. So for the next uh, for the next few days, get ready for a bit of uh, in transition. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, what everybody needs to do now, I'll tell you, all right, here, a, a few things that are just facts, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, number one, tech, uh, uh, tech stuff is very frustrating, right? Just in general. Number two, if you are a streamer, there are few things that are more frustrating than getting tech support piecemeal from the chat. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. things it's uh, and look it's not because you don't you might have the answer you may very well indeed have the exact answer that would solve everything but for whatever reason the digital gulf between the streamer and the chat makes it very frustrating so what i would only ask as bryce's lawyer <laughs> Is <laughs> I love the fact that I'm not even involved in the discussion because it used to be me melting down with rage and frustration, and then and then I became very zen about it. <laughs> just, just if you love Bryce and if you see somebody else doing this, just please say, hey, look, if you have an idea on something, you want to know what? Send an email. Send an email mm -hmm. that at some point later, if everything craps out or Bryce is looking to draw straws, that can be that. 
But uh, uh, for, for chat stuff, as the studio comes alive, as sound <laughs> the solutions are being figured out, let's, let's try to just do nothing but support the people that are putting it together. And offering random solutions is not necessarily support. Yeah, if you, okay. if you have any feedback, the more specific you can be uh, helps. We just had someone in the chat a second ago say, is the audio strange for anybody else? And I had a huge conniption. So uh, the more detail you can provide, the better. You know what would be good would be some sort of discussion forum we could put for all this advice and maybe a hashtag on Twitter where they could send these suggestions. I mean, you can always a separate to Discord. Yeah, somebody, somebody make, somebody make a, a channel on the on the uh, uh, Diamond Club Discord that's just like random tech musings. If you have a <laughs> random tech musing, please, put, as long as they're siloed, and also understand anybody who comes in and says something like that, because I know how triggering that is triggering to me when somebody's like, "Does anybody hear that?" Like you're in the middle of like screaming, and someone's like, "Anybody hear that?" And you're like, "Now it's the only thing you can think of." You know, for for until somebody else fixes something, and you're you end up breaking things that were working good because you're trying to fix the thing that you don't even know. So yes, it will sound different. The last studio had a decade plus of exactly fine tuning where the audio needed to be relative to the space. We're on day one. Let's let everybody uh, grow into the space with 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 grace and ease. Yeah. Uh, the it's really off for me. It's all in Korean. Well, that's definitely something that we do need to fix. So Bryce, get on that. I mean, <laughs> we, we were not even speaking. Anyway. <laughs> all right. I think. Mm, I think we're ready to start. Oh my gosh! For those guys just joining us for the first time, uh, this is uh, our program, Weird Things. We're uh, three folks who don't believe in B Bigfoot, but we think he's awesome. We talk news of the weird and the paranormal, and the fringes of science and technology. And uh, this is it, the beginning of our first podcast from the new studio. How cool. By the way, thank you to everybody who joined the Founders Club. Uh, I just sent out a thank you email last night. Nearly 700 people kicked in some cash to uh, get us over the finish line. Huge. It's like your own 700 club. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I mean, technically, I wanted to send we I wanted to send out the email when we were at six hundred and sixty six, but then but then more people jumped jumped in. Oh, I'm ruining it, Jesus! I tell you, I never really thought what a thin difference it is between six 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 and the seven hundred club. <laughs> I mean, just over versus uh, almost is is yeah. is that land that we're in. I'm good. You good? <laughs> All right. Yeah. I think that I'm good. All right. Let me count you in. Let's start weird things in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the weird things. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. Brian, your background looks different. Uh, does it? Because it looks like maybe the exact same background I've always had. Uh, maybe the lighting is a little more even. Does it, does it feel a little bit more spacious, like there's room it's to more breathe space. here? Did you get smaller? Did you shrink yourself? Uh, <laughs> oh, it does kind of look like that. Now that I'm looking at the feed right now, it looks like maybe it's a miniature version of Brian because the background's a little out of focus because it's farther away. But no, we're uh, we're broadcasting from the brand new studio for the very first time. I'm sure there's there's probably some quality to my audio that is not quite uh, what everybody's familiar with as we continue to figure everything out with the monitors and everything. But uh, but this is it. We're we're out of Diamond Club Studios at uh, the Seven Acres Wood now. Wow, awesome! That's very cool. I'm um, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> in the hovel <laughs> the podcast hovel uh hey folks uh man there's a it's one of these things where you're like man i don't know if there's enough stories and then you have so many you're like i'm gonna have to push this till next week and push this to next week because a lot of stuff comes the weird just happens um yeah. let's start off with an update though on the uh storm area 51 oh my gosh yeah. did, did it happen how many people well, formed I mean, bands I, 
At this point, Brian, we are still looking for an exact number on how many alien cheeks were clapped, but it, it does seem as if there was a, a far less turnout than at least the initial three million that said that they were going to do it on Facebook might suggest. Uh, well, so how much how much fewer can it be, right? I mean, you know, three million people. I know that when you send postcards, direct response, you're happy to get like a one percent response rate. So even if only one out of a hundred of those people were to show up, I mean, that's still that's still what uh, 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 thirty thousand people. I think we're. I think the terms like homeopathic levels. <laughs> yeah. So uh, most of the news that came out, aside from what, what was uh, uh, just uh, everything you would want and to expect, uh, as the day grew near, there was an amazing live uh, local television report where somebody was Naruto running behind the anchor. Uh, there were some very fun Twitter videos. But I think we were in, and Andrew, if, if you have anything more official here, the last I saw, we were in the hundreds, maybe even low, low hundreds. Well, no, it's good because that was it's the best. Yeah, that allowed the police to go in and I'm getting my voice back. Um, that allowed the <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, trust me, I'm more annoyed by my voice than anybody else. Um, the police were able to go in and they say, give very stern warnings to people and tell them, hey, uh, probably not a good idea to go beyond the certain limits. And so that that message seemed to be effective. People showed up. They went to where they were allowed to go. They hung out. They're like, hey, we're here. Yeah, that allowed some photos. The media showed up, got some photos. And so uh, best possible ending. Yeah, you know, there were a few organizers that had expected uh, closer to the multiple thousands, if not 10,000 range, that had two-day festivals set up that wound up becoming one-day festivals <laughs> because just not enough people wound up showing up to what was, I think, uh, Rachel, Nevada, but uh, you know, the, the town kind of on the outskirts of where Area 51 is. I don't know what the result of the downtown Vegas thing was, although I suspect that that would probably attract X amount of people who just happened to be in Vegas and had little to no interest of driving into the heart of the Nevada desert. Yeah, did, did yeah. they ever reveal what, what mysterious classified acts were going to be at the uh, Las Vegas festival? Uh, I take a wild guess and say a teenager with dreadlocks and a laptop. That would be, <laughs> that would be my educated guess. Yeah, I wonder if we could pull that up. Um, it's, you know, and, you know, we could we could chalk it down to the conspiracy, you know, that that the men in black managed to, you know, stop the fun on this. It's more I bread and circus, know. am I right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that it wound up, it wound up ending, uh, uh, the, the one thing you didn't want out of this was a public safety hazard or, God forbid, somebody to get hurt or worse. So... We avoided that. The, uh, the internet got its memes. Reddit was still awash in uh, various different macros of the Naruto runner behind the, uh, uh, behind the live report guy. So I think anybody who was very interested got what they wanted out of the Storm Area 51 event. If you try to go to the Storm Area 51.us website, which is the one where they're supposed to have concert footage, it's like not a secure <laughs> website, and you have to insert your like secure, you know, your password to get access to it. So I don't think we're gonna find out. No. Yeah. yeah. Sounds almost like it was thrown together kind of last minute and half-assed. Well, I mean, yeah, it was obviously right. Like yes. this was only there uh, because somebody had a 4 million uh, <laughs> a page thing on Facebook. So was the, that the th concert we're looking at there? Yeah, I guess this was downtown. Yeah. And yeah, that looks like a, like, a, yeah. like a big old event. Like that looks like a great yeah. little downtown event. Yeah. yeah the, on, I found an article that did not list any DJs that showed up, though it did say that a few were there. Though apparently the one that took place in Rachel, uh, in, in, or no, Hico, in, in Hico, Nevada, is that right? 
Uh, I guess they got Paul Oakenfold out for that. <laughs> and that's oh, my one, God. That's the one where I mean, hundreds of people showed up, and then Arby's came by the next day to give away free food. Uh, so a whole a real mess, a real mess of stuff, huh? Oh, man. That, that free Arby's, though, that was, that was almost worth a plane ticket, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, let, let, let's just say if that had been pre-announced, Andrew would have been. No, it was. It, I didn't bring it, it up was? last they did announce that Arby's was going to go there. I just didn't get a chance to mention oh, it. Oh, oh. I was torn. <laughs> uh, the Arby's menu. <laughs> so uh, this Saturday, it looks like we're going to be getting an update from Mr. Elon Musk on the progress of the Starship. That's the next generation SpaceX rocket that's designed to go just about anywhere in the solar system. And we already saw te the test of the Starhopper. Now they're building Starship, which is going to have like three Raptor engines and would be, I think, orbit capable. And so Elon's going to tell us the more details on this. We had uh, some new updates just from the images we're getting of this thing. It's being constructed right now. And you can see over the last couple of days, they put the wings. They're not really wings, but they're like, you know, stabilizing surfaces on the craft. And it's taking a different form than what, we originally thought it was going to be, and Saturday we'll find out more about the, 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 the overall look. So when you say orbit capable, does that mean you're not saying single stage to, or, to go to orbit, just that it, what does that mean, orbit capable? Single stage to orbit, capable of doing that. That's crazy. With, without any kind of, I, 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 guess, I guess that's a function of, of just how empty and light everything is in there. Yeah, and you wouldn't get it back without it having to like the idea he says that elon said via twitter which is the most reliable way to get detailed information about engineering um he said that if it was fully fueled that this would be capable of reaching orbit but you would not be able to bring it back down and do a propulsive landing on it. oh got it got, so it, got it so 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 enough fuel also, to it'll... get get it up there but then it's gonna have to crash in the ocean somewhere yeah, but simultaneously, they're actually building the booster, too. So they have all the, the, the they're building this thing in these big stainless steel rings that they're welding together, but fastening together. And so that's being built, too. So they're going to have a full stack. But what they want to do is they're going to test just the Starship and bring it, you know, going for like, I think doing like a 28 mile jump first or something. And then I don't we don't know if he's going to try to orbit that thing or not. Man. He's building two at a time. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of money. I, I think if you're looking for a big display of awesome power, all I need to see is it going what looks like out of the atmosphere and then coming back down and landing. I would much rather see that than see it go all the way to orbit and be told, anyway, Poochie died on his way back to his home planet, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that... It, 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 you know, the, the end game for this thing is that it's going to always it's going to be used with a booster. And so certainly to put it into orbit and then like, yes, you know, it's now it's going to burn up and look at that pretty light. But as an engineering thing and kind of like doing the thing that's never been done before and doing what, what people have thought is impossible, there is something to the idea of a single stage to orbit. I mean, there is something there is something about like, hey, yeah, no, we built a single stage to orbit rocket. Isn't that cool? Because also. The thing about doing single stage to orbit, if you can get into a stable orbit, it's like you have, hey, we just put a space station up there. Yeah. Oh, wow. What if they set it up to orbit and then they were like, yeah, we're going to go, once we get this booster done, we're going to go bring it some fuel and it'll land later. Bring it back. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. So who knows? You know, I don't know if he wants to launch the thing and then, you know, burn up untold millions of dollars, you know, in that process, but I, they could do it and just test. I mean, going really high too, is they want to get a lot of data back about reentry in the aerodynamics and stuff. So I, I, who, we don't know. That's kind of the beauty of it is we don't know. We did not expect this to come together so quickly. The fact that the, you know, star hopper has already done its, you know, we've already seen that fly. And now that we're going to see starship, the, the Mark one starships, you know, in the next few months, take off that's that's like that's movie timeline that's insane yeah uh, yeah uh, so so what kind of timetable do you think that we're, we're we're looking at from this announcement or are we are we gonna get timetable at all the the what he's we'll get a we'll get an updated timetable for sure what he said in the previously was 
they hoped to do to fly Starship this year. They hoped to fly Starship this year, meaning that craft would not go into orbit, but to have it fly, you know, 28 miles up or whatever the distance up is, you know, go one really of those, high. One of those, one of those hops, right? Just to make sure that it can blast off and land back. Yeah, but a huge hop, a much, much bigger yeah. hop than we saw before. Um, a hop that we'd be like, well, it looks like it's going to space, but not. And then he said early next year, orbital. And they're building the booster, so that could mean, you know, putting that stacking on the top of a booster and then taking off from there. They've been ma- they've been making changes to their Cape Canaveral launch pad there, which they think is going to be for accommodating Starship. So next year, orbital. Wow. So let, let's talk about this announcement that's coming up. You, you said it's this weekend? Saturday, yeah. And and is there any expectations about what he's going to uh, talk about? I mean, obviously, they're putting on the, I don't know, winglets, the stabilizers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so there's going to be some kind of unveiling on there. But but does anybody have really much of a clue as as to our, what, what claims will be made? From an engineering point of view, there's been a lot of questions about what they're going to be using for the final look of it, like the final aerodynamic shape will be two wings, three wings. He says two wings now. Uh, what will be the the heat? You know, Are they going to be using heat tiles attached to the surface for parts of it? The look of it, uh, you know, and I, and I think you know a calendar of what the the plan is. The final, like what they say, they think the cargo capacity is going to be because that's been changing. He's talked about stretching it from the original design. I have, you know, the a mock up of what was like the last announced design here, which uh, we know is now garbage because he's changed it so many times. Hmm. Um, and uh, you know, we'll find out probably what's going to be closer to the final iteration of it. And you know, their plans for Mars, et cetera, probably. Oh. Cool. Damn. Cool. Well, I'll I'll give you guys a plan. How about you head on over to patreon.com slash weird things and support this very podcast? Folks, we moved into a whole new studio. Brian is right now live from Diamond Club Studios in the Seven Acres Schwood. If you would like to make sure that we continue to utilize that space for all of your weird things glory, then go ahead on over right now. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you go. If you're a patron, you get our After Things podcast before anyone else and the satisfaction that you're making this happen. Thank you guys so much. Patreon.com slash weird things. It's not easy being a podcaster out there. You it's know? not. It's not. True story. I don't know. It's pretty easy. You just sit there and talk. And people tune in and listen. And then you, you say, go to my Patreon. And then they show up. It's pretty easy. I had a real job once. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, you know who also has a real job? Who's that? Uh, people watching the skies for stuff and things. Oh, Some dude. of the people who watch the skies, their job, they're not pros. In fact, you had an amateur. Have you heard about Comet C2019Q4? No. I mean, who hasn't? Me. Well, remember when uh, remember when Obama, who, or however you pronounce it, came to, was pretty big news? That was the interstellar object that came into our solar system. Yeah, like, the big hey, kind I'm- of like vaguely rocket-shaped ellipsoid that was, that was tumbling around. Yeah, and we were confused because it like it didn't match the profile of a comet. We're like, what is this thing? And it's like, later, dudes, I'm gone. And we're like, wait, we didn't even get to know you. Well, we have Comet C2019Q4. Now appears to be another interstellar visitor. Oh, man, look at that. All of these freeloaders come, r- r- come scooting on in, soaking in our stellar rays, and, and then off they go without leaving so much as a tip. Wait, now, what's the- that? What, what, what is what is that, just to describe to the audio listeners, what's that, like, beginner magic trick with, like, the gem rod? Oh, the hot, hot rod. rod. The hot rod, yeah. It looks like a, a, a hot rod in space as it, as it is tumbling through our solar system. <laughs> so the cool thing about this one is because we're calling it a comet means we're pretty sure it's a comet, so we know what it is. But it's a comet from another solar system, by from what we understand. And it was discovered by amateur astronomer... Uh, Genadeya Borisov, okay? So that's kind of awesome is that you have somebody out there who's a hobbyist who spends a lot of time doing this, though, who is able to discover, you know, you know, a comet. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of awesome. It was, you know, chances of finding something like that are crazy, but he did it. 
I'll tell you what, that's one of those things where it's like, yes, a bunch of people with telescopes, that's a low fidelity instrument and maybe low fidelity of education or expertise when it comes to astronomy. But like you can't argue with those numbers when you just have the number of amateur astronomers out there. In fact, this last couple of weeks has been extraordinary. Uh, if you're a background a backyard astronomer, both uh, Saturn and Jupiter have been stellar, uh, so to speak, uh, over the last couple of weeks. It's been really good viewing. Yeah, and he, by the way, he works as an engineer at the Crimean Astronomical Station, but he's an engineer. And they're like, they point out, but he's not an ast astronomer. Well, he's made a discovery uh, most astronomers would uh, spend their lifetimes hoping to capture. You yeah, know? man. He's got a little thing called eyes, and he can see comets. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, honestly, and this goes beyond that, but I know this is rampant amongst the scientific community or, or certain uh, fields. Once you do something that it's a credit to the profession— what you you congratulations you you got fast tracked in like astronomers what are you doing drawing a line between you and a dude that found something that nobody else found like he didn't go to school like student debt that's really what you want to be like the only thing between you and somebody now nah, just bring him into the fold you have to you have to contribute something amazing to get in without doing all the training, he did it. Congratulate I, the man. Don't I feel, I feel like we're dangerously close to doing our exact night attack bit, railing on student debt all over again. I'm, well, no, I'm, whatever student debt, I'm sure that we could go and get into that. I'm just saying, you know, it's the same thing with uh, 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 Richard Garriott and not being an astronaut, right? Oh, that yeah, he has to be he called a be cosmonaut like, because only members of NASA are astronauts. It's a, whatever. He got up into space. Not everyone's going to do it because what you're worried about is, is people diluting the, the phrase, right? It's like, well, anybody can be an astronaut. Yeah, anybody can go to space. He got to space like 10 years, uh, two decades before it might become commonplace. Give the man a piece of cake. <laughs> uh, there's a fun story. A school in Michigan, apparently uh, there'd been rumors floating around that there was something strange in the pond next to the school. But uh, I mean, you're talking about Gary? He's there all the time. He just gets a <laughs> what, twice a year. He gets in there and washes off all that, all that uh, uh, grime he picks up as he rides the silver rails, uh, eating beans out of a can. <laughs> well, Gary caused a little bit of a concern, Brian. People well, worried about but, Gary. Uh, Gary's harmless. Name one terrible. Actually, don't name anything Gary's done. No, yeah, yeah. Come on, Brian. It's 2019. That lifestyle has a lot of pitfalls these days. <laughs> Well, it wasn't until a, a a teacher actually spotted this, spotted as we're calling Gary, that people started to take the story seriously. And uh, authorities went in and took a look and said, yep, there's an alligator in this pond in Michigan. In Michigan? What? How does an alligator get all the way up to that Michigan? That is an alligator. And they got this dope drone footage of it, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh Wow, so next to the high school whose nickname is the Kicking Mules is Gary the Alligator. Uh, wow. Man, they're that, getting the most out of that drone footage. Hell yeah, they are. Uh, uh, so they had to actually basically start draining the pond to isolate the alligator, and finally they, they found him. And like, yeah, hey, alligator. So, so how, how, how uncommon is this? Well... You had the stories of alligators being places they weren't, you know, um, happens often because people buy them as pets. People get hold of them and they bring them to areas where they're not used to. And then they eventually they get a little large for the terranium or whatever. And then, you know, we've heard stories like, you know, some crazy woman raising an alligator in her bathtub. And then you're just like, I'm going to let you go free in, in Michigan where you love the winters. And. Put and there. that's and that's profoundly dangerous, obviously, for yeah. for the alligator. You you got to get them into a place where that they, they're they're more naturally suited to yeah. live, right? Yeah. If we talked about how alligators can survive winters in ponds or lakes where the water freezes over, no, but I would love to hear I, about this. I have heard stories of like freak cold fronts that every once in a while come through South Florida, and that lizards will just go into like suspended animation in trees like big lizards right mm -hmm. and then they'll just drop as if dead from the tree only for them to like wake up from the warming of uh, uh the the impact and then start skittering around 
Yeah, we had a we had a case where somebody was saw all these dead iguanas and started shoving them into their car with the heater. Oh and my god! As gosh. they were driving, the iguanas <laughs> came back alive. And well, and and when they're cold blooded, when your cold blooded animals, you know, just kind of just get cold, not quite freeze, but just get cold. They do, they do get very, very stiff. So I can imagine picking up an iguana, and it's like uh, it looks like a, you got it from the taxidermist, and then all of a sudden yeah. you're like, ah, oh, throw them in the back, it'll be fine. Well, dude, dude's just trying to clear dead iguanas from the yard, right? <laughs> and on his way, all of a sudden, it's a, it's friggin' pandemonium. All these <sighs> like freaked out iguanas are going nuts in the back of his car. That is amazing. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's one of these things, I've heard the story a couple times and trying to find out the original source on it and make sure it's not apocryphal. Uh, but yeah, um, that's the problem because these things start to thaw and people are like, oh, look at these dead, you know, iguanas. Let me pick it up and let me pose with it. And next thing you know, I'm alive. Um, so just be warned. Uh, but the thing with the alligators, the way they'll do it is they found that alligators will actually keep their their snouts above the ice and so you could be walking along on a frozen pond and just see what well, it looks like an alligator snout. Guess what? Oh, my gosh. It's an alligator. And, and like, I, I assume they breathe. Wonderful. At that point, the colder they get, the slower their metabolism, so they don't have to breathe very much, right? Yeah, just they can still they keep the snouts out there just so they can get enough air. So uh, that would be kind of freaky. Oh, I'm going to kick that rock. <laughs> Holy cow. Ooh. Oh, my God. Also, imagine that you're, I mean, like, what what a majesty of the animal kingdom that an alligator's like, yeah, I think this is getting a little cold. I'm just going to leave my snout up here as we slowly freeze to what would be fatal levels for anybody else in the animal kingdom. Uh, well, we, I got two more stories related. It's Wild Cat Monday. Oh, <laughs> You heard, you heard what, is that uh, our sounder? <laughs> yeah, that's the wild. That's the Wildcat Monday sounder, beloved by all. <laughs> Have you heard what's stalking Paris along the rooftops? Is it a uh, wildcat? Uh, <laughs> we need the alarm. <laughs> uh, apparently, there's some pretty amazing photos of a black panther spotted roaming the rooftops of of Lily, France. Actually, wow! And, a uh, panther. You see these photos. A Panther, What's that? Panther? A panther, panther? <gasps> black panther. <laughs> isn't, a, isn't a black panther just a, a, a cheetah all the way black? <laughs> Brian. You know, I'm just... I, sorry, no, I, I say just as if that's not. A cheetah with black fur. No, I, 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 what I mean is, I, <laughs> is it, if yeah. I remember correctly, there's a bit of trivia that it's not a distinct uh, species from cheetah. It's just a cheetah's coloration. Let me let me yeah. double check is my it, facts. Isn't is it a black panther just a, a, a cheetah, one of the most fast and deadly animals on the planet, in a dark level, therefore making it stealth and all the more deadly? Leopard, uh, is that what it is? I don't know. Uh, yeah, our our hive mind in the chat room is pointing out that it is indeed a black leopard. Got it. Yeah, sorry, Jaguar you mean leopard. just a black leopard. <laughs> yes, just, I mean, no, if it's not a cheetah, who cares? <laughs> yeah, because, like, the difference is, like, cheetahs, like, almost never, ever, 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 ever attack people. Like, cheetahs are pretty di docile and pretty, pretty afraid. If they attack somebody, it's very rare. Like, they the usually have cheetah attacks. It's, it's because yeah. they were midway through making a comment on YouTube, and that cheetah's just had enough. He's all hopped up on these cheese balls. Uh, you just, actually, Brian, I say because they're vulnerable children, but whatever you want to go with, that's fine. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, so, but yeah, you know, panthers are, panthers are a little ferocious there. So you got a, you got a panther stalking through, you know, France. So there's that. And again, probably, you know, somebody's pet, you know, who are these horrible pet owners too, by the way? I don't know, dude. I, I remember mean, when I was on there's tour. Only, there's only two, right? We know who these pet owners are. You can go column A, column B. It's either super kooky animal lover, right? Who or drug is dealer. Just hoarding, or drug dealer. That's it. There's only two. There's or three. the Pablo Escobar super kooky drug dealer. Well, sure. Yeah, I guess really like B is he A, had but th he that had deals hippos. drugs. Oh, God. Yeah, right? Dude, <laughs> hippos are terrifying. 
How would you like to be one of his henchmen in the room and he's just you know doing rails and drinking? He's like, ah, you know what I want? I want some hippos. Like, ha ha ha. No, click. I want hippos. And you're like, how the f do we get hippos here? <laughs> that well, problem solver. We needed to hire that guy. I mean, uh, uh, for anybody who has not seen, extra bonus pick. But if you have not seen the ESPN 30 for 30, the two Escobars, uh, to just get a sense of the extravagance of Pablo Escobar, uh, uh, there is a he was in jail kind of nominally by way of the Colombian government and uh, just decides, ah, I'm bored. Um, hey, send out my private jet to dot through Europe and South America, pick up all my favorite soccer players so they can just play a game for me in the prison yard uh, that me and my friends will bet on. Like, that's just like, a, you know, a Wednesday. I'm just feeling a little, uh, a little peckish. Remember the Kevin. I miss my hippos. Remember the Kevin Smith routine about uh, Prince Land? No, I, I, I don't about, think I like, saw that. He he did a he, he did a, he's talked about this a couple times where he's he got called by Prince to Prince's compound in like Minneapolis and uh and where people just you know, Prince had his like his his sort of devotees around him whatever. And, you know, and, he and Prince was doing some sort of, like, idea exchange. It was sort of very, very, very nutty. And Kevin Smith talks about the fact that, like, Prince, you know, has mentioned something about, like, wanting something. And Prince thinking that if at 2 a.m. he wants a giraffe, somebody will get him a giraffe. You know, <laughs> that's Prince land, is you just think this is going to happen or whatever. And then Kevin came away from there, and he talked about it, and Prince got upset. He's like, you signed an NDA and all. He's like, no, I didn't sign anything, you know. And, and so Prince is upset, but he was talking about Prince land, how – how crazy and delusional you can get when you're super famous and sometimes people are used to accommodating all your wills and you take a guy like Pablo Escobar like where you do have that money and people afraid of dying yeah you end up with the world's best soccer players playing in your prison yard or you know <laughs> a pond full of hippos so squad yeah. goals. squad goals exactly we all Brian I'm just saying I know that you are very uh, you're an aspirational uh, aspirational person. These last couple of years have all been about getting this studio. So just so you know, there's always north. You can always look up. Like you're not <laughs> what's, you're not really succeeding until you get a pond full of info. What's funny is the moment the conversation turned to all the crazy stuff Pablo Escobar would do. Uh, I, like this is me like just jellyfishing back away into the background because I know what's coming next is the suggestion box of ideas. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's just also like, you know, you're just, you know, putting in your in your secret board. You're wishing it into uh wishing it into existence by speaking sure. its name. So while we were having the, the stories of Black Panthers uh stalking France, meanwhile, Washington DC, stories of a mountain lion stalking through neighborhoods, including a ring camera photo of uh some uh large cat climbing a fence and people starting to worry that there's a cougar in their neighborhood and worried about their pets and stuff now the dc department of energy and environment director is like hey listen they're not native to here nobody panic but i think you're like you're like oh tell that to france and it turns out this uh well that spoiled it uh it was actually a neighborhood cat that looked a lot like a mountain lion getting really <laughs> it does <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is for a split second, I was like, well, maybe a lynx? No, it looks yeah, an awful like, like a house cat. The, the, there's a photo from, I'll send it to you, the, on, it was Huffington Post, where you see this image on somebody's ring can. And if you saw that, like, I would be like, I, I could be a mountain lion. And by the way, for the record, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., the same area where uh, uh, the television head man, who was dropping off televisions, uh, in uh, around that area, so the DC ring cameras just blowing it up right now. Yeah, see that photo? Like you go back yeah, to where it see starts, that. and you yeah, see that photo. Thing. That photo I would buy if you told me it was a I don't know a jaguar or whatever <laughs> or a mountain yeah. cat. I would buy it because the edges of those super wide angle lenses distort and make things look bigger. Yeah, and also the light sort of uh, kind of kind of blows out the detail on it, so mm -hmm. uh, it's a little difficult to tell the scale on things. And so because the, there's the also there, there's 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 a car in the background and when it's climbing up this fence, it almost looks like it is like half the size of the hood of the car. Yeah. So, this is the second story we've we've had that's been, you know, should be sponsored by ring.com, be honest with you. 
Yeah. And I mean, first of all, can, like, 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 like we're dangerously close to uh, the weird things becoming the ring report where all we do is find awesome, weird images that get caught on ring cameras. Yeah, that might be the new the new thing, though, because we had a lot of like ooh, spooky ghost stuff on surveillance cameras until we realized a lot of all the artifacts that caused that stuff. I mean, people still get spooked out by them. But now we're getting more and more ring camera stuff. Maybe it's I mean, all viral. It, Maybe ring is doing all of this. Uh, I mean, look, stranger Stranger rings have happened. <laughs> I mean, keep in mind, there's a reason that there's that unremovable watermark on all ring videos that has the word ring on there because they know that, like, we're going to capture some stuff. People are going to share it. Easiest way to do it. We'll have a little <laughs> logo. Hey, pitch idea. All right, let's call a meeting. Okay. All right. All right. Call in the meeting. Go ahead. I call let's, the meeting to order. Let's get hold of ring. All right. And say, hey, we can help you out with even more crazy stuff. Oh, so you're like, if you're not, if you're not faking them, wink, like, guess what? Get in the game because we are going to design ring specific happenings that will drive sales through the roof, baby. All right, look, uh, okay, so we're already in the pitch room, right? And it's like, hey, man, yeah. you thought you thought TV Man was a big hit? We could do much better than put on a freaking TV. How about Abbott okay, Cotton? Hey, check man. Uh, Brian, hey, check man? What's that? H-Track man? No, no, no. Listen, the whole world's going to go nuts when all of a sudden a fully formed, perfectly rehearsed ring video shows up of two people dressed like Abbott and Costello doing who's on first. They walk up, they do the full performance in front of a doorbell, and then turn around and walk away. They do it every single place in the neighborhood. Somebody's going to be like, what the hell is this? It looks like (laughs) Abbott and Costello just showed up and did who's on first. I don't want to step on this, but you'd be like, ah, oh, it's just two local idiots doing an Abbott and Costello who's on first. Uh, no, but not when uh, they're vampires. Look, man, we, uh, we can make it weird. Wait, oh, buried yeah. the lead. Yeah, yeah. Not, 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 when we, not when we provide the DNA test and it's really Abbott and Costello. <laughs> <laughs> what if, like, you could do, like, we could just do commercials, like eating a Whopper, you know, in front of somebody's ring camera, you know, like the mystery Whopper eater or something like that. Uh, you, you get to uh, yeah, dress up as two Mormon missionaries who walk up, and then and it's uh, as though it's the beginning of Pulp Fiction. They're just talking about good burgers, and they're like, man, I can't even believe that this is an impossible Whopper. I'd swear that it's real meat. <laughs> they have a full And it's like, you know what? I don't even want to bother these people. Let's not ring the doorbell, and off you go. Did a a scene by scene remake of Star Wars, but in one scene in front of each house with a ring camera. <laughs> and so you had to put them all together. And then they're like, "Oh, we got to see the cantina scene." Oh, Frank won't let us see his ring cam. <laughs> oh, Frank, typical. Two people walking past a house and they pause to argue about like, "Hey, man, I got my money. You can stuff your rebellion. Good luck." And then off they run. <laughs> or we can do we just do magic. Ooh. Ring, ring only magic. So, uh, so, so you the sneak up. The linking rings. You sneak up to a bunch of houses and just do magic for the ring camera, and then move on to the next house. Dude, this is gold. We're giving away free genius publicity ideas here. Hey, Anybody want to make a name for themselves? Go for it. I know. Ring a ding ding if you're a ring representative, because we got that. We got spun gold for you. Ring casting. It's the new thing, guys. Ring casting. <laughs> So, let's do picks. Hey, hey, I know I've I've made this pick a couple times. I'm going to make it one more time. Succession. Man, do I really like Succession. If you haven't seen Succession, go see it. Uh, it is in season two now. I binged up to catch up to uh, uh, even up to the episode last night. Oh, my God. Andrew, I very rarely push something on you, but you need to see Succession if just to see there is a, a plot line through the second season where the Murdoch-esque family that is uh, at the center of the show is trying to buy a family, another family-owned media company. And uh, this one is very, it's basically like an NPR meets the New York Times kind of, uh, uh, you know, amalgam. But it's the super liberal, like, doppelganger family of our main characters and it is i mean it, there's just something about indulging the fascination with how the super rich live 
and how how warped everything is that I just can't get enough of. And just watching the super liberal version of it just delighted me to no end. Cool. So I went and saw Ad Astra over the weekend. Um, I guess I can't really talk about it because you guys haven't seen it and you're not going to want plot spoilers, right? Uh, Andrew saw it, right? Yeah, I saw it. Uh, um, I, 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 I do not care about spoilers. Why do you need to talk about like, spoiling too much of the plot? Yeah, well, the... uh, I, I think you need a little bit more of a plot to spoil it. Uh, <laughs> um, what is uh, this? I keep hearing scuttle about this movie, but I don't know anything about it. I thought it was a biopic, but it doesn't seem that way. No, no. It yeah. takes place in the near future. I'll tell you this much. Uh, let me begin with the part that, that alone makes it really worth watching. The world building is phenomenal in this. Like this near future, you... Uh, uh, Brad Pitt is given a mission and he's told to keep a low profile. He's going to be flying commercial to the moon. And it feels like exactly what I believe uh, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, a commercial flight to the moon would feel like right down to normally I hate product placement and wedged in current brands that we know, but I totally believed it when I saw the subway or the Hudson news or whatever. Uh, I totally believed it when he asked for a pillow and a, and a blanket and was casually told that'll be $127. Uh, I, I believed it when we got to the slightly more sparse environments of Mars. I believed it when we were on the fringe of things and made it all the way out to Neptune. It's, it's a very, very believable world. The plot is surprisingly thin and very untypical of a Hollywood plot. I, I, I was like, well, that can't really be what they're doing. And it turns out that was what they were doing. I was like, oh, all right. But I enjoyed the world so very much that I do recommend it. I, I give it a thumbs up. D did you like it, Andrew? I, I had uh, similar feelings to you. I, it is a beautifully done movie. And I say beautiful. It's not like every shot is beautiful. Like, it, it is a, there is a genre of science fiction, which is the idea of, and, and you got bits of this, like, in a, um, Anathem where you you kind of have a future but it's strip malls it's 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 not the the glo everything's a glossy city that you think it is it's still filled with smoke filled casinos and things like this the future where you have it's a mixed future the idea that there's these really cool high tech things but in some ways there's still you know walmarts and just vast industrial tracks and stuff and so it's a very interesting maybe more realistic and i liked this because uh, the director, I think it was James Gray, what he did was create this future where we have, we're, we're going to, you know, we have, you know, settlements on the moon, on Mars, and yet parts of it, like, you know, you go to the moon and it feels like, you know, it's, it feels like Universal City Walk, you know. You go to Mars and you're like, you feel like, man, the best days, it was like the exciting part was probably 20 years ago, you know, feels like this is now sort of at the, the waning part of this age of exploration in a sense. And so um, it's depressing, but I thought very, very, you know, beautifully done. It did feel like I wasn't quite sure about the consistency of like, if this is the case, why is this the case? You know, if you sort of analyze, like we could get into in the spoiler territory about like, you know, this feels like this is such a rare thing, but you know, I don't know. It, it, Cause you're in a world where like, yeah, you could fly on Virgin, you know, Virgin Atlantic to go to the moon, but like there are only like four people in there, and then you go to the moon and there's an Applebee's. And you're like, is this for rich people or people who like Applebee's? You know? And that's well, a minor I, thing. I, I got the impression that they did a good job of portraying Earth as crowded, and they portrayed the moon as bustling. They portrayed uh, Mars as kind of under construction, and then uh, and then out beyond that. You know, we didn't we didn't really see any specific uh, places, but there's a couple of beats because you got to have something interesting happen on their way. Uh, general alert. I think it's in the trailers that, you know, you're watching somebody take a journey from Earth to Neptune, you know, the uh, farthest out planet. Uh, and you got to have something happen along the way. So I thought. I thought they did a great job of the dust up that happens on the moon because they set up enough that there are disputed territories or whatever. 
uh, and you're watching them on a rover just getting from point A to point B, and then just in the background you see a rover, and even though it looks like the exact kind, same kind of rover as the one that they're in, you know that's probably trouble, and sure, sure enough it is. But I also enjoyed the very brief um, uh, made a uh, haunted ship moment on the way. I thought that yeah. was a nice little I... self-contained five-minute mystery. Yeah, and it, but it, it builds up, it, it, but it does build up the larger universe. It sort of sets the stakes for what happens, though. There is a, hey, this is sort of where government in the world has gone, and so when you finally find more revelations, you kind of understand, oh, yeah, this, this, it does fit into the world building, but I do agree. I, I, I walked out of there going, um, that it's one of these movies that, like, sometimes you see somebody dips their toes into science fiction or space because a director says, I would love to do the challenge, I'd love to do that. And then you find, like, I like I loved Interstellar, but I wished Interstellar would, was 20 or 30 percent more developed because I think it's a beautiful, beautiful movie and some of the best elements there could have been expanded. And it seemed like Nolan was excited about making a space movie and had a date, which that movie was going to come out, whatever state it was ready to go. And Ad Astra sort of feels like James Gray wanting to do a space movie and... Uh, the script he and Ethan Gross did, you know, I felt like I felt like there's probably multiple versions of this, and this is the path they went on to. And I, and I, I uh, again, see it. Go see it. It's a beautiful movie. They try to do space in a very realistic sort of way. They don't explain things too much. I think. Um, I don't think I don't didn't walk out of there at the same. Like I, I think the best movie we've had in recent years on space is Martian and like Gravity. You know, um, you know, Gravity was a consistent. We knew it's survival, Martian survival. Yeah, very I think, clear I think both The Martian and Gravity benefited from fantastic characters and fantastic uh, high-energy plots. Ad Astra is a little bit more of a meditation, and you got to kind of yep. – there's a little bit more telling and a little less showing that I would like from that kind of movie. So it doesn't really mm -hmm. compete on the, on the same level. But I that, that in is, terms of that, world that is... building, I, I think the world built in Ad Astra is, the mo is more believable and more realistic and more rich than either Gravity or The Martian. That is kind of a fascinating thing, right, that if you're not doing a fully kind of like – fantasy or genre space movie that space movies tend to be like quote unquote near future realistic you know kind of space movies tend to be either very survival like shipwreck or you know some kind of uh, a, a element of like I, I shouldn't be here I need to get out of here this is go this is an inhospitable place that I need to escape or very meditational it's like like Solaris or even it, you know, take the horror element of like Event Horizon or something like that, or Sunshine, or something like a, like a, the Fountain. Yeah, well, Fountain. Yeah, I mean that that that's all you know, a, a, a probably a more aggressive explosion of that idea. But there's there's just a lot of shots of people looking out of windows and thinking about what it all means. Yeah, here I put this is in kind of I think the new cool category that I like though of, of Gravity, Martian, and now Ad Astra of like. Let's do stories about people and not about, you know, aliens or supernatural occurrences. Let's do people, you know, and, and set it in our own solar system and stuff there. And I think that's kind of neat. And I think that, you know, um, Martian was the most successful of that. I mean, Gravity probably one of the most critically appreciated of that. I think Ad Astra visually is, is neat. Um, so absolutely see it. Uh, we'll, so. we'll talk about it in after things, but I'd be remiss if I didn't at least put a, a, a little tip of the hat to my 15 year old daughter finally got me to watch in all of infinity train. The episodes are only like 11 minutes, 12 minutes long each. It's from the guy who created regular show and it's pretty much a uh, snow piercer for kids. A uh, kid, kid running away, wants to go to camp, ends up finding a magical train where each car is another crazy world with a mystery to solve. And uh, uh, guess what? She makes it all the way to the engine at the end of the season. Uh, but along the way, there was one moment that, uh, you, you, like to me, the hallmark of something truly great in comedy is when I am dead ass alone in a room and I burst out laughing until the point of crying. And in this case, that happened and I, I had to walk down the hall and apologize to my 15 year old for ever having <laughs> doubted her. It was, it was really a lot of fun. <laughs> Highly recommended. Uh, my pick is the iPhone 11 Pro Max, whatever. Um, the, the bro? Uh, yeah. 
And uh, my reasons for this is uh, my girlfriend shot a movie last night or shot. She Yes, she shot a, uh, a short film last night and we were out in very, very dark in a driveway. And uh, in between doing stuff, I was able to get some behind the scenes stuff in that. Um, and it's a new feature, like, you know, the uh, Google Android phones have it too, which is this, you know, the ability to shoot in really, really, really low light using, you know, artificial intelligence that sort of figures out, like, I think this is what this is. The low light photography on this fantastic, the super wide angle on there is amazing. So if you're, use your phone for camera stuff a lot, really, really, really recommend if you're thinking about upgrading, very happy with it. And and that low light alone is amazing. Again, if you're in the if you're in the Android universe, congratulations, you have your version of that too in the newer phones. And so you know we're getting a new Pixel, which I'm sure is going to have a fantastic version of that. But night mode on here is amazing. The super wide is amazing. So uh, yeah, I I have it too. Um, you know, whenever the new phone comes out and they're like, it's the best camera ever, and it's got so many megapixels, it'll make you cry. I'm sort of like. You know, I go around and I take pictures for the first couple of days and then eventually I accidentally smudge the lens and I'm just like, this camera sucks, like, uh, and I'll just kind of forget about it. Uh, I gotta say, the experience of having three lenses, three cameras on here is just kind of a game changer as you're like zooming in and zooming out. Previously, you could very much obviously tell this is a digital zoom. You, you, the picture is degrading the further you get in. And certainly you can get to that point now, but the range in which you are just in like actual awesome lens zone is 99% of all pictures that you're going to take. Like it's, it's awesome. I so, want to show just a couple photos on my camera, which is not the way to do it, but like you, you get the idea at night where you know, you're seeing the only lights coming from inside so is, the car. Hold on. This shot, if you were to just show it to me without context, I would be, I would tell you that it looks like this shot was taken at twilight because it looks like you could see the sun setting behind. But if you are telling me that that's full on at night, that, those are just city lights in the background creating that 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 glow. Yes. Let me send this to Bryce so we can send a better one. Uh, it is that is the glow of Los Angeles behind them, and like it, it's. It's one of these things where it is just so much. Um, I'm going to send you a photo of Roshni directing. Um, it is so much. It, it's it's better than you do. I mean, but not you. you. Maybe not you. Me. You know, see, so it's better than me at night when it comes to that. And it looks like HDR. It's just I thought I thought the night photographs were amazing because they just looked so good. And you know, we did some cool lighting in the car and stuff. But this is me just standing outside, pulling out my phone, grabbing photos. And, you know, we, we live in this really cool age of, you know, cameras and stuff. And I can show you a photo of Marcus Eddy sitting in the car. Um, but, yeah, it is. <laughs> is Marcus Eddy in the short film? That's awesome. Marcus stars in it. Marcus is our star. Oh, that's fantastic. Marcus was, was amazing. So, For those who don't know, um, Marcus Eddy is an extremely talented uh, magician. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad he's doing that. Yeah, Marcus was on Penn and Teller, just recently on Penn and Teller Foolish, came back, fooled them, um, and you know, works with David Blaine, does all sorts of creative stuff, all that. So, and I'll send a couple photos if, you, if we have a chance to show them for our, our live audience here. Um, that was the thing that just blew me away, though, was being there at night and pulling my camera out when I never would have pulled the camera out before because I'm like, ah, I'm not going to get any images here. And then, you know, you hold down the button, it says, hold it still for three seconds. But it's smart enough to know if you move the camera, it'll still try to get the faces right and everything. You know, somebody has to be moving around a lot to get to be a blur. That that function is great. The super wide angle is amazing because How you just long until. So what we're seeing is a case where it's almost as though the camera isn't actually taking a snapshot of that moment, but instead it's gathering enough data that an AI can tell the story of what that moment looked like to you with your eyes. And it makes me wonder how much longer until we enhance that because yes, factually, this head was tilted that way or whatever. How much longer until we have an AI enhance the storytelling elements of a photograph as well? So where it's like, let me, let me make this head bigger. Let me bring this in, let me frame. There's a lot of dead space in here. What if we just crop this? In other words, doing the job that, that photo editors, the humans do. 
I mean, number one, uh, uh, AI process, or maybe not AI, but but certainly uh, uh, processed photos are about as old as smartphones. Like as soon as you had the ability to do that, each, you know, I remember uh, looking at like old photo comparisons of uh, uh, Samsung phones versus iPhone stuff, and you realize that there is just a certain level of like base processing that phones would do just to make sure that every time you look at a picture, you're a little happier with it. And this is even pre Instagram filters and stuff like that. Uh, but look, Brian, I think you're right. I mean, we're seeing it more and more, uh, uh, you know, the Apple portrait mode is, is a great example. I know that there's, there's certainly other things on, on Android that do a similar thing where now you are just looking at a image that is unreal, that is literally unreal. And, uh, for to your point, the question would be, all right, are there things that we deal with now? And let's, for example, take something like red eye or something like that. That was uh, an early problem with photography that that just kind of made you look weird and you wish wasn't there at, at, in a bygone era. Uh, is there a thing that you can do or a thing that happens in photos that we don't even think of as solvable now? Like, oh, my eyes were closed or or my hair was out of place something that could be subtle that would make everything kind of just look better that is is more of a every time if it were fixed it'd be better uh, than we might realize now that's yeah, an and, interesting idea and and well and there are there are people in the chat that that apparently are missing my boy they're all like androids had that forever that's not what i'm talking about i mean to the level where the ai in your phone is listening and understands the context of what's happening and understands that well this moment was a sad moment it was the surprising moment that that you know this happened or or this is a happy moment this is the moment that somebody found out about their diploma so i'm going to take of this six second window, I'm gonna take these elements, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand it, close this in, I'm gonna blur this out, I'm gonna make this face pop, I'm gonna actually gonna take for the face, I'm gonna, there's a better photo from 20 minutes ago that I'm gonna use to comp that up and then and recreate that moment. That's, yeah, tell me you have that on your Android phone. You can't, jerks. Yeah, I mean, they've had, yeah, the, the, they've been combined. That's been, a, that's been an iOS and Android for years. Like an iOS, I think, was the first to do the HDR with the three different picks and combine it and do the color resonance. And then everybody, there's that war, like, oh, we'll do this to this. Androids had their own night vision thing before. And, yeah. And it's, we, we, we kept saying that. But sometimes people don't hear you say that. Um, they hear, ah, iPhone, ah, shut up. Um, but uh, it's a matter of each one, it gets improved and they get better and better. You know, this version of the night vision is the, best I've seen out there between any phone. And then when we get the new Pixel coming out, I'm sure it's going to have amazing features. What's nice about this, it's built right in. You don't switch into a separate mode. You don't go, well, I got to go take a night vision mode. You just pull out your camera, boom, press the button. And what this does, and some of the modern phones will do, is they'll start, that camera will start before you press the button. They're already getting data and getting ready for that photo so they can say, well, you just press the button, but the camera didn't move much. I have enough data to go do this. Um, and like, yeah, Brian, to your point is that I could see where you like enough photos where they know what you like as far as your face and your pose or whatever, it might start doing that. And one of the cool things the iPhone has is really good depth data. And there's apps you can see now because they know where the foreground is and the background is where you can change the lighting and move it around and give your face side lights and direct lights and stuff. A lot of that's going to get built into modern phones, you know, um, and when that happens, like, yeah, where we already talked about how, you know, the the feature we have on the phones where we, I showed you where it does the depth map and you can actually change the angle of the face as you move around. Right. And we've talked about how like, that may be used in FaceTime to make it look like you're looking at the per at the camera and not the person. Yes, I so. mean it, it, we've talked about this before. There's no, there's no faster way to telegraph that you are a, a grandparent than to. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate for the live viewers than to make sure that you're talking to someone like this, where your <laughs> eyes are clearly <laughs> not remotely on the camera. <laughs> well, Brian, you know the point is that uh, if you want to do a show. You got to make eye contact with yourself <laughs> on the camera screen. Uh, my eyes are Price here. My eyes are up here. Uh, no, I have not received anything. Oh, well, all right. Well, who I sent them to. Um, so anyhow, uh, the photos are like really, really cool. So again, you're, if you get any, whatever your platform of choice is, there's going to be a version of these 
features, and I think you're going to be very, very, very happy. So, um, um, I'll just see if I can pull up one more. But it's just the the it's just exceptional. So, anyhow, that's my pick. Cool. What about you, Bryce? You got a pick? Uh, yeah, I got a pick. So I last week before it officially launched, I, I was on the iOS 13.1 beta, which comes out in like two days or something. Uh, and I got into Apple Arcade, and I've been playing a bunch of those games. Uh, but the one I wanted to talk about today is uh, is this interesting visual novel called NeoCab. Have you guys heard of NeoCab at all? So it takes place in the uh, uh, in the future where you are a cab driver uh, in this metropolis of Los Ojos, and you are a driver for the NeoCab company. Uh, but the the city that you're in is a big, uh, oh, what are they called, Capra. They're a big Capra company, which is all autonomous cars. And so as one of the only human drivers in the entire city, you are meeting people, uh, trying to uncover kind of what um, corporate you know uh, uh, mis misgivings are going on. You sort of navigating the police who are you know uh, very pro Capra. Uh, you are you have friends who are involved with this uh, anti-car uh, um, activist group, uh, and so it's it's a, it's a really interesting game. And all the while, you are actually you're you're not you know driving the car with a with a steering wheel or anything, but you're making choices and you're talking to people because you have like a star rating, and if your star rating goes low, then you might uh, lose your job. Uh, but you have to make money and you have to pay for the fuel for your car. You have to find out where you're going to stay at night because your friend, uh, the begin the inciting action is that your friend who you're going to live with uh, disappears. Uh, it's, 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 it's really interesting. Um, uh, and, and I think it, wor it works really well on the phone. Uh, apparently it's on PC also. Um, but having, having it on the phone with the Apple Arcade stuff where there's you know, a hun like 100 games right now, uh, is is really cool. I, I think if if you're in the uh, in the Apple Arcade space or if you're trying the free trial, uh, I think that's one to uh, to really check out. So uh, I, you you've mentioned before that you've been playing around with the Apple Arcade. Hmm. Is that an enthusiastic thumbs up worthy oh, expense? Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, Five dollars a month for all of these games. That any single one of them would have been two or three dollars alone is is well worth it. I mean it's it it. Uh, it, it solves the like in-app purchase problem that kind of everyone has with with mobile games, right? Like, oh, it's a free game, but they want you to play, uh, they want you to pay for coins or whatever. But it also solves the other thing of really nice, really small mobile games mm -hmm. that cost two or three dollars and only last a couple of hours, and then you finish it and you're like, oh, that's very good and very short. It, you 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 don't bump into that like feel like you wasted your money. Uh, because there's a ton of games. Because you're not thinking from, about it on a per unit basis. Just right. like uh, it's it's like uh, you know you go to the Chinese buffet and you're like, uh, well, I certainly would have paid five dollars just for that, but you know that was a fun. Couple but of if nights. I can also get a slice of pizza with it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, so, I've, I've, I've had it, asking. and I'm not a big gamer, and I thought it was delightful because of that. Like you have a, the us two, the people who made Monument Valley, they have a little another little novel sort of game, which is a symbol with care. Yes, a symbol with care is very good. But it's like if I'd paid like five bucks for that, I'd be like, I don't, mm -hmm. I could have spent five bucks on a bunch, much more intensive game. But you get the end of that, like I, I, it's part of my whole monthly plan. It really cost me nothing. And you're like, oh yeah, that's cute. And you have room to create stuff like that. And I think that's wonderful. And so there's, uh, Apple Arcade is like the best value out there. And I like mean, the five dollar, it's five dollars a month, and that's a family plan. So if you got kids, if you got multiple devices, that all goes to it. And like yeah, an hour, yep. just an hour ago, Google announced uh, their Play Pass, which is seems a little different. They're going to be taking paid apps and making them free for their subscribers. Uh, details are still incoming about that, but uh, yeah, well, it seems like they're doing their own version of that. Yeah, it's great that they're doing it. Yeah, we don't know like what what Apple's done here. Like they went to Monument Valley makers and said, "Hey, we want to make a game games. especially for arcade. We'll fund you if you go get into the game. It's published by Apple." And so there's a lot of just 
you know, only on here sort of uh, games and stuff. That, and, and Google has the ability to do that too, but that's sort mm -hmm. of what was nice about this was like, there are exclusives. It's not just, let's just take a bunch of stuff and shovelware that's been out there and just go for sheer volume. Yeah. There are some really quality originals that are deb debuting here first that you would easily pay five bucks for any of them. And, you know, uh, you know, and stuff that'll make its way elsewhere. And like, and fun stuff. Like, did you play a uh, pinball wizard? Yeah, pinball wizard's fun. You, it's a pinball game, but you're knocking around a piz, a, a wizard through this room, and so you make it's him run into enemies. It's a dungeon crawler. Yeah. With pinball physics, so basically you're you're bouncing this little wizard around a, a circular oh, room that's, that's like hilarious. a turret, and you I hear did, his feet yeah, pitter patter and, patter and stuff because he's running. Yeah, you go up levels. <laughs> so. There's that. There's a there's a new game from Pendleton Ward and Zach Cage. Which is like a uh, it's like a card pickup type game, mm -hmm. uh, card card of darkness. I think my my only complaint about Apple Arcade, and I've seen a few other people on Twitter say this, is uh, that a surprising number of the games will take over audio priority on your phone. So if you're listening to a podcast or a music, it'll stop it. Yeah, um, a handful uh... of them, a handful of them don't, but a lot of the ones that you think should like respect that don't and it's yeah, very weird man that's a bummer uh, there are games that i full-on just will not play because it's like look i don't need to hear your bing bong booms or whatever mm -hmm. uh, yeah like i understand for some where there's cinematic or storytelling elements or voice work or whatever mm -hmm. you could talk me into that and saying i would rather you oh, not play the I, game than play the game without the audio i think it's a bug because i started playing a game and i'm listening to the the soundtrack i'm like so a little bit Howard Shore-ish. This is interesting. And then I go through and through, and I go to a cutscene. The music continues. It was playing the Lord of the Rings soundtrack in the background. I'd never opened up my audio controls, but there was something, and I realized I clicked it over, and for some reason, that started playing. So I think that might be... Well, no, I no, no. I, 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 there are games, and this has been for years, there are games that simply will not allow you to play a podcast instead of the game audio. They will oh, shut I, off... I understand that. Yeah, I'm saying, but if we're saying that there's a big problem with Apple Arcade games, I'm telling you that I had a problem with an Apple Arcade game that was doing something funky with my sound system. It may not be they're all telling you you can't use your sound. There may be something else at play. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, and there, there are, you know, I've played four or five games that will, that won't kill your audio. So I don't think it's like, you know, some big mandate from Apple. Uh, though I do think they, there's, we, we've talked about how they might be monetizing these games in terms of by playtime. And so I found that the Apple Arcade games tend to unload from your phone very quickly. So they'll like, if you swipe away from it to do something and you come back a few minutes later, it won't still be up kind of running in the background. It won't be mid mid move. Yeah, yeah th there is a time limit uh, like on Hearthstone, like you're mm -hmm. connected. It's a live game you're playing against another person. Mm -hmm. So it's like when a text comes in, you jump away and you're like five, six, seven, eight. And if you take too long to get back, yeah, okay, it's going to be like, well, yeah, I guess you yeah. disconnected. You lost. Well, these will, oh, and I'm talking about unloading the app. So you would, it would, you would boot it again, oh. basically. Uh, which oh, is, wow. Which is not a, a big deal, but it, it's, you know, I, I haven't had that happen to any of the ones I have on here. Hmm. Uh, it might be because you're on I, the Pro. It could be because you got more RAM or something, or on the yeah. 11. But yeah, Apple Arcade, a very, a very big uh, endorsement. And NeoCab, I think, is a very interesting uh, game to start with. Man, I just realized that right now is the farthest behind I've ever been on upgrade cycles for my phone. I still have an iPhone 10, mm -hmm. and I have not bought the uh, uh, the 11. The 11. Are you gonna? Uh, eventually, but it's very hard to ask people for financial support and then go out and buy iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they made it they made it thicker and gave it a bigger battery, uh, along oh, with all I the will, normal stuff. Brian, when you were like, "Oh, my kingdom for a battery that doesn't die halfway through uh, the day," I have I don't think I've sniffed sixty percent, and oh. I have been just as obsessive about this phone as I was probably more so than I was previously. Like, this thing is a hoss. For, for the audio listeners, just imagine I'm rubbing my nipples right now. That's exactly <laughs> what I want to be. And I, let me be clear. Like, you had a bunch of people invest in this property, in this compound for you. Let's say you're at the far reaches of there and a brush fire breaks out and your phone's out of, out of battery. <laughs> How responsible are you, Brian? Yeah, if you know, you're you right. Make and by the way, investment. 
let's say that you're, that it's happening at night and you can't take a proper photo of the fire. <laughs> you know what? I mean, I mean, I'm not going to claim that there isn't an actual Sasquatch living on this property, but if there was, it'd be a real shame if I couldn't get a decent photo of it. Seems like the only responsible thing to do is for me to get the iPhone 11 Pro, uh, whatever it is. Pro yeah, and hop into your brand new white Land Rover and, uh, you know, <laughs> call somebody. So, yeah. Did, did we go too far on that? No. Oh, no. no. I think we just ran be, out of steam would, on the would, bit. Because <laughs> it would definitely be a Jeep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a little too much righteous gemstones for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, love that show, by the way. Oh, my God. It's, I, I, want, I caught up on that, too. Jesus. Just so I love every inch of it. I'm just gonna just tell you right now. Hey, misbehaving slaps. Oh my I'm, god, I'm there, that that I'm there like, unironically. complete unironic. Like like like. Oh, they're gonna start the thing and then they're gonna move on. And then I'm like, they're not moving on. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm really digging this. This is fantastic. <laughs> the, well, you know, the, new, the newest episode. The new episode also has uh, has a, a, a dip. Uh, I mean, they they do it again in this in this latest episode this week. And yes. it's so great. It is tasty. Brian, yeah. Misbehaving is a song that appeared on the Righteous Gemstones that's mm -hmm. like a folk Christian song that's supposed to have been from like the 70s. And you hear it and it sounds like something that's like a real, it's a really well done song. And you're like, oh, is this, is this a thing? And you're like, nope, made just for the show. Yep. Yeah. I mean, because it, it's like it's like Donnie and Marie, but more, you know, for, for the, the, the specific super Christian like uh, audience. And it's. <laughs> It's awesome. The, it the only clue, the only clue that it's not a real already existing song is the line, run around the house with a pickle in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I don't know. Not... That's that's that that to me, Brian, that is the wabi sabi. That is like the one thing that makes it like a, a, a country fried great is like yeah. that kind of line running through the house with a pickle in my mouth. <laughs> Especially because uh, a... when you see in the latest episode, old, old footage, spoiler, but it doesn't really has nothing to do with the plot of uh, uh, baby Billy and his sister singing it when they're like eight years old, you know, yeah. in a black and, and you're like, oh, yeah, like I could see like that line being something a kid would say, like in a kid lyric, like, yeah, so great. Uh, we did have your. Uh, uh, oh, the there we go. And look at that. That looks, that looks like it's straight out of a movie. Yeah. I mean, I guess you were making a movie, which is why it probably looks like a movie. <laughs> and shooting it on an iPhone 11, so um, cool. So That's so great. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it reminds me of, like, the, the old National Geographic, you know, where you'd see, like, those amazing night shots because they were using such good, you know, low-light films and knew what they are doing. Here, I don't know what I'm doing. I just press the button. So, cool. But, awesome. yeah, that sky, that, it's a, that was a dark sky. So. Cool. All right, it's been weird. With a pickle in my mouth. <laughs> Run around the house with a pickle in my mouth. <laughs> Misbehaving. Boy, she can sing too, man. Like, yeah. uh, it, it helps that she's an actual country music legend. Yeah, she was a great choice. But who was that? Uh, the, uh, the sister, uh, the, the, the dead wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I didn't know who the actress is. Uh, I don't oh. know her name either, but apparently I she, looked. If you go to her Wikipedia, she's primarily known as a country music as a country singer. music singer. Yeah, Gen yeah. Jennifer Nettles. Nettles. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, dude. Um, she's great. Yeah. That show rules. Like, uh, just awesome. Oh shoot! I didn't tell you guys. So you know, uh, you know, Bonnie had uh, her art featured at uh, the Umlauf Sculpture Garden, which is a very, very famous uh, ceramic uh, sculpture garden right next to Barton Springs in Austin, Texas. She was super jazzed to be able to show three other figures from the Moonlight series on there, which she did not expect at all. Was as they're giving out awards, she hears her name, uh, and uh, she got she got honorable mention at the Umlauf Sculpture Garden. So it's uh, it's an it's award winning ceramics. I mean it's it's so huge. Like it's they're so established and so big time. I mean, oh, look, that, this is you know uh, uh, the, the the progress that Bonnie has made in like flipping that switch and going to like full time artist again. Like is just insane. Like and it's just it's so amazing. 
Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, here, uh, we're on break for a little bit. Uh, yep. Sure. We'll do after things here in just a moment. Cool. Are you cold? It's cold. Is it is behaving? cold. I, I, think, I, think, I think test is successful, right? Yeah. We, can, we can warm it up a little bit. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and you're the one in, in flip-flops, too. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you, everybody. We're going to do after things here in just a moment, so stay tuned. Uh, if anybody else needs a break, feel free to go do that now. Well, here's a headline for you. Campbell's testicles bitten by women at Louisiana truck stop pettings. <laughs> oh. I tell you, it's always the crazy animal lovers of the drug dealers. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Forget, you know, Florida man, Louisiana woman. Louisiana woman, yeah. Uh, yes, no, I will be at TwitchCon. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing that's this weekend. weekend. Oh, I will be there for Mike TV's thing. Oh, nice. He's doing a live show on, is it Thursday? Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll be there early. So get there early. It starts at seven. Uh, I'll probably be there even before then. Uh, so come on over. Mike TV is going to be performing and I'll do a little bit of emceeing. Uh, up top, uh, but yeah, and then me and Michael will do misbehaving. Nice. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, and so, so Mike TV coming live uh, in a couple hours for the smooth winter movie draft after yes. uh, all oh. the court killers and spoiler time. Do you just by the way, your... by the way, yeah, I got a ringer. Oh, okay. Who uh, is it a surprise? Dra I don't know. Do you want it to be a surprise? Nah, here. Uh, let, let, email I'll, I'll get, me, I'll get email the, me the person so I can get make sure that they're I, on Skype ready. I forwarded him all the information, okay. uh, but I'll loop you in here now. Please do, because I don't, uh, I just need to make sure we have. Let's just say he is not a stranger to this process. Okay. And yet he has never drafted. Ooh. So that, right, that wipes out like some of the more auxiliary, like the Gargills and the Murphys. Someone who knows it, but has never played it. I wonder. All right. Okay. There we go. Little, little All right, here. Hold on. Oh. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm texting you or emailing both of you, so you you both have. Uh, you're both brought together. Oh, perfect. Uh, but you can go ahead and take a look, see whether or not you should let people know. Or you want to keep it a surprise. Loading up Gmail. <laughs> and now, now hold now. Okay, this is a solos league. So, uh, is he is he just being? Is he just a hired gun? Is he just working your? It's a hired order? gun. He's a hired gun. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll, uh, all right. All right. All right. Look, you, 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 <laughs> we got some leeway. Hey, you want to see something cool? Yeah. Let me see. What's the best way to show this? Uh, we'll do like this. There we go. Check it out. So when we were setting up the studio. Oh, nice. I uh, had a GoPro following me, moving it around a bit, and uh, put together all the footage. Uh, this this video file is like three minutes at 60 frames per second. It was about 20, 22 hours of, of setup condensed down into three short minutes. Three. How on a on a scale from super easy to really difficult? Where was this compared to your expectations? Uh, it was a little more difficult than I than I thought it would be. Um, and certainly now that we're we're using it and we're we're figuring out more things that we need to solve, that's that's adding to it a little bit. But the whole process was uh, was was pretty straightforward. Once we got, they were just like, there were two little road humps that kept that that made it really frustrating. It was this capture card setup bit uh, because the we have a very specific thing we have to do with these cards and frame rates um, that is not that I forgot and is not. I mean, look. That was, you know, one of my favorite things in working with Colleen and setting stuff up is when she was trying to figure something out and she's like, at a certain point you just realize that 
you know, Black Magic is not just a clever name. <laughs> these things, <laughs> these really things require an actual death pact with Satan yeah. uh, uh, to, to make work correctly. Uh, but we got the new audio setup going here. Uh, apologies for some of the hiccups with that at the beginning of the show, but we should have a good recording here. Uh, Again, nobody just, this is going to take a, a process. Uh, professional studios that people move into, the audio sounds better two months in than it does on day one. So yeah. just, it, it, it's going to be fine. Oh, you're right. Uh, I, I didn't think about the fact that, that to the casual eye, it's like, well, I thought it was going to be an upgrade in audio. Why does, you know, new place sounds bad. Yeah, this I is mean, this is my fan voice. It's a, a, a decade, a decade in one place to make sure the audio sounded perfect. T yeah. Twenty-four hours. In, now we have an entirely new. Hey Bryce, language. if you could post a link to that video, I'd, I'd love to tweet that out. Um, or is that internal right now? Uh, I I I have I, I uploaded this to my personal account. Uh, oh okay, out the door. all right. So so I don't actually know what I'm going to do with this. Okay, uh, we're just showing this off right now. So I I just sent you all a link to a video. Which I didn't want to bring this up on the show. My favorite my favorite YouTube channel almost all is is Two Minute Papers where they do a lot of stuff about AI stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. And there was a recent paper research paper that came out where they've got a really good new face swapping algorithm. You know, much better, much faster, whatever. Really robust. The paper came out last month, but unfortunately, what look go back. Look what they use as their example. Oh, jeez. Wait, what? <laughs> Xi Jinping and Justin Trudeau, who is having quite a moment right now. Oh, oh, because of the brown face. Because of the brown face. Yeah, this came out a couple weeks ago, and then, then you know, here, here's our paper. Check out our face swapping with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no, we're doing great research. Oh, jeez, that pick. Oh, oh, you know. So. This is fascinating. This is. So this is models were not trained on the subject. So this wasn't a thing where it gave them like hundreds of high resolution photos to make these. No. Wow. If only I knew what Ludwig Göransson looked without <laughs> without John Bailey's face on it. <laughs> oh my goodness, Alfonso Cuarón on Re Regina King. Wow. Oh wow! wow. Oh wow! That's him. Wow. Incredible. Well, it was a good run of being able to trust video for 20 minutes. Yep, 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 whoever you are. All righty. I remember years ago, you know, I had an interesting conversation with Marvin Minsky, who talked about how... The ability of like AI to replicate or do this, and Marvin made a very interesting point, and that was, our friends know more about us than we do, about our habits and our patterns, and that's certainly true. That like, I could see an AI that could watch enough of our podcasts and stuff, and say, you know what, I think I can make an even more entertaining one because seventy percent of the time you go for this bit. I want to mix it up a little bit, you know, and we're done. So you're saying a version of the show where Elon Musk isn't in every episode. Yeah. Well, if he didn't do as much interesting stuff. <laughs> uh, what, what do we want to cover for after things? I guess we could kind of talk about the studio, right? Yeah, do a little studio, and I got another topic that we can dig into, too. Um, cool. The, the age, you know, kind of a, a cool food tech thing I, I heard of that I want to kind of spring on you guys. Oh, you know what? I... Uh... Yeah. I do, but we actually had someone email in about Ad Astra. I think mostly just to see. Yeah, so so I guess uh, before we go live um, uh, on the show proper, I mean, I guess we can. Like, d did you like Ad Astra? There's a, uh, we'll get full on spoilery. So if you want to be protected, turn down your volume or something. But like, oh. weird plot, weird. I I plot. I really liked it. I liked it a lot. My my criticism of it was. My two criticisms, major ones were, and I would love to be a filmmaker like James Ray. Let me make that very clear. Like, I'm like, I'm all, let me tell you, like, my, my, as an audience member, my two crits were, one, uh, oh, Justin's back, but I'm trying not to be careful. I think that the, the, the Tommy Lee Jones character um, 
it it, it I, I, there is a way you could have done that story and fit within that universe and and had him do the things he did, but make him way more sympathetic. Yes, I, and, and I think that's what I noticed was that uh, like that's a pretty crazy thing for him to have done. I bet he's got a pretty good reason. No, he doesn't. <laughs> you know, and that that, that was the part that disappointed me. Because like a big part of the theme of this thing is about like you know in this in this world, space com is the big our big space thing, and and. You know they're manipulative. You know they're doing really bad things, and you know that they're 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 super manipulative, and they're just you, you just can't trust them, much like the real government. Um, and I thought that you could do a thing where, hey, like this guy was put in a position where this was going to happen. It's kind of it's his fault, but not really his fault because you know if you put a crazy person in a situation, and there, there could have been a way you could have made him more sympathetic and still every it's still as hard a darkness as sure, you wanted or, or maybe he's responding to a very convincing false positive or something like he truly thinks that well this is this is a bold terrifying decision yeah. i have to make in order to make this happen or whatever just like in in apocalypse now which is what gray was based it on um uh the the uh Brando character, I guess his name just escaped me. Um, he, I know Kurtz. yeah, Kurtz was like, Kurtz was this machine the government kept using and using and using and using and using and using, and using until he became this broken thing they had to stop. And and you 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 Kurtz never should have happened. You know that was the government's fault that Kurtz happened. You know, and th and that's kind of, and that's more clear in Apocalypse now. You know, you encounter Kurtz, you're like. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen at some point with this guy? Because you keep telling him you take a, a, a psychopath and keep putting him in the situation. This is this is this is what's due. So, I think that could have been a little bit more. And I think that for the universe building, like I said before, was because you know we. And that's not a spoiler, but you know you meet people on Mars who were born on Mars, so you know that there have been people on Mars for 40, 50, 60 years. And that was my point that Mars was like lived in because like you go through the rows and rows and rows of just empty racks and stuff, and you're like. There was a big period here, and now it's just sort of run down, and it's like, you know, where you know, you know, the moon has now become this this tourist Vegas tourist trap kind of thing. Yet it's still wild. I just kind of felt like I'm sure there was a clear picture there, but a lot of it was sort of inconsistent to me a bit. But I loved it, though. I still enjoyed it. I mean, I really liked it. Yeah, cool. I mean, what's your take? Oh, I, I mean, I liked it. Uh, I, 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 I love the world building, but just um, on an emotional level, there was an awful lot of just telling me, like quite literally, uh, Brad Pitt telling us how he feels. And I'm like, seems to me like if you were doing better storytelling, you wouldn't need to tell me. And instead, I'd just be feeling what he's feeling. I, and, and so yeah. it felt a little bit tedious at times, but... Uh, but as a collection of, of world building vignettes, I thought it was utterly delightful. And I do recommend everybody see it. Yeah. It's yeah, just like, no, like I, gravity. I, you didn't have to tell me anything. You didn't have to explain to me anything. I was, I was there. I was in it, uh, man, uh, everything's blowing up. Uh, I get it. Let's go. You know, same thing with the well, Martian. The, the moment that sort of, and there was a, there's a touchback to this, the thing with gravity that sort of drove me a little bit nuts though. And it was way too telling. It's when she's crying and they make the tear just float towards the camera, you know? And I'm like, I get it. This is pulling taste me out of the them. movie right now. Taste them. Taste Sandy's tears. Yeah, I was a little, that to me, that was like, and I know what you're saying, like literally having a character say, but that was a moment where I'm like, <sighs> like I had, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, first time I tried to watch Gravity, I walked out. Oh, of I know. Yeah, you, you, you left. You got up and left. It was just like, oh, for, and then finally I'm like, all right, just let them go do the crazy over the top and then get into it. And then I, I loved it. I mean, enjoyed it. Here, there's a moment where Brad Pitt cries and he's in weightlessness, but it just, the tear just goes down his face. Uh, like, well, and, and, and literally down his face, like you would expect, yeah. you know, if there were gravity, which there isn't. Yeah. Which is weird that it would go down. <laughs> yeah, I was like, eh. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't have minded a little bit of a nod to the fact that lunar gravity is different than Earth gravity, but they didn't yeah, try. that was. Yeah, and that was that was one of the things. Was it like, and, and it's and it's like Gray wanted to make. I want to make the most realistic film. Okay, you know the thing that makes you bounce around and stuff on the moon isn't the spacesuits. <laughs> you know, I mean, and and, and maybe it, I I forgave it thinking maybe it would be distracting to the storytelling. Maybe it's hard to have gravitas as both people are bounding like 
like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, you know, uh, through a air a, a spaceport. But I, I would have liked to have seen just a little bit of that. You know, The Expanse handles that so wonderfully well with the sound of the shoes. Yep. You know, and you're like, you hear these shoes, and you know, like, oh, I know they're weightless now. You know, they, they do that really. And I was, that's the thing I'm watching them walk, they're walking around and stuff. I'm like, you're going for realism and you just failed big here because the, your, your depiction of people, you know, on the moon is exactly like people on Earth, and well, you would expect. And, and again, more. I, 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 that used to drive me nuts. Now that I'm older, I, I, I rewrite saying like, okay, whether or not it looked like this, this is how it would feel to me. Like for example, when, uh, when, when, when he, uh, spoiler alert, gets to the place and an old movie is playing, I was like, well, an old movie would be something from 2010 or whatever. But if they were to play an old movie from 2010, then it would take me out of it because that would feel like a current movie. So even though it's very unlikely that this person is watching a movie from, let's say, oh. 150, 200 years ago, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it matters to, tell, to convey to me, the viewer, the feeling of, okay, it's an old movie that's playing. Does that make sense? I mean, as, as, as a guy that watches movies from the starting point of film and sound, I disagree. Like, like I, I have favorites that were from the 1920s and 30s when they first had it. And the, the guy, his, his character liked musicals. We knew that he liked musicals. So that was very consistent to me. It's, yeah. like, it's like if somebody liked music, like, why are they listening to, to, to Mozart? You know, it's got to be Def Leppard. I'm like, no. I mean, it could be. Well, I'm not saying it needs to be anything. I'm just saying that I understand why they might overshoot to bring a feeling uh like maybe but that was a character point we knew that was established that what he liked to watch sure but but how different would that scene be if la la land was playing i mean if you love musicals your first choice may not be la la land okay, fine but the point is a, a a a there's a reason they on purpose avoided a a contemporary uh popular award-winning musical uh, and that would be because it would take us out of that moment and not convey the feeling that Brad Pitt's character was having when he encountered the scene. Maybe. I, 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 I see your point. Would, I don't would, know. Would, yeah, would, would it have been different if it was Hamilton? Yes. Or some, you know, a movie version of Hamilton or something. Well, I mean, my, I, I, my, my guess, I don't know. I don't know what their intent was, I'm saying, but if you have a character that loved old musicals, then I would imagine that watching, having them watch a really old musical, like, you know, doesn't, t I, I just, it's like, like I said, the music, oh, they like old music. Oh, they're not going to listen to my Mozart. Like, why not? People still listen to that. And if you like musicals, that's one of the musicals you like. Yeah, I, I think you're misunderstanding my, my point. Uh, my, my point is not that they should have done one thing or another. I'm, I'm describing my understanding of uh, why, why it's better that they did what they did. Yeah, I, I think, okay, again, my point is like, if, if, when somebody says they like musicals, again, 50, 60 years from now, I would imagine they would still like musicals from the 1930s, and that would probably, they would probably Nobody like Nobody's disputing more. that. It, it, at this point, you're having an argument with n nobody here. Okay. Moving on. I saw Hustlers. <laughs> How, is How is that? How is Hustlers? It'll be my pick. I'll, I'll, I'll... I mean, are we, are we already into... <laughs> we're uh, already into picks. Things? No, I, I think yeah, I'm ready, I think we're ready to start. Okay, right. well, let's do after things. Then in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hey, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo yo yo. And Bryce Castillo. Hello, everybody. All right, studio. Tell us about the studio. When do you move in? It's going to be, what, a year from now? You're going to be in there? Oh, man, it feels like that. that a year quite from now, literally. a year ago. I mean, you, when we bought the place a year ago, you wouldn't think uh, it's going to take over a year before you can just <laughs> move some computers in here and get started. But guess what? It took over a year. Mm -hmm. But the good news is we moved some computers in here and we got started. That's right. Uh, so over the weekend, uh, over across two kind of heavy days, uh, I was in here putting, putting this old bad boy together. Um, uh, I, I got this time lapse that we'll figure out a way to publish, publish somewhere. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it was a thing, you know, I, my, my goal in setting this studio up over the weekend was what can I do for free and cheap and, and right now to get us 
back to where we were at in Brian's house. So, like, just, just back to functionality. Right. Fidelity um, be damned. Uh, the potential down the road be damned. Let's just make sure that we're able to show up on Monday and make another podcast. Well, and, and, and Fidelity is, was, was a secondary goal, because I think it does sound a little different today than, than it was last week, but uh, overall pretty good. There's, there's a lot of cleanup behind the scenes in terms of the audio setup. Um, some stuff has been simplified. Some stuff has gotten more complicated. Um, and because we're in a different space, how we handle, you know, things like our studio monitors is different. Uh, you know, we have less less video monitors in here than we normally do. So, you know, Brian is 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 able to see like one third of the things that he normally sees, and it's much smaller, also. Um, but but overall, I'm 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 really happy with it. I mean, Brian, you're you're the one who just did an hour of a podcast. I mean, how how did you feel? Yeah, well, I, um, I'll be interested. I mean, the biggest thing, I don't know if we want to flash uh, the, the disastrous cable porn on the back of this thing. I am curious how we're going to cover up all of these cables mm -hmm. uh, for some kind of cable management, because I don't see it being possible for us to zip tie all these together, especially because we're constantly reconfiguring stuff. Right. That's just going to be... A well, disaster I, in the making. Actually, I, I think the the boys got back from a shopping expedition for, probably within the past hour. Uh, hopefully, to get some hooks to help kind of clean clean it up. There, there is. We've got three computers and a mixer all pouring cords into the same space. And mo actually, most of these cords are velcroed up and and um, spooled a little bit. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it just looks like a picture picture a bowl of black spaghetti, and that's what it is. Like, yes. just all down the back of this thing. Uh, and again, that was like, I need to get this done and working before bothering to make the thing no one's going to look at except, except you and I yeah. um, look, look nice. So, what, what, what do you think we'll do? Like, right now we have, we have uh, functional lighting, but my guess is that there's a level of expertise beyond uh, even both of us put together on on lighting, uh, pro-level lighting, uh, should, we, should we hire a lighting person to install a light grid and figure out oh, the right way to... Oh, you're talking about lighting, lighting technology. Oh, okay. Uh, like, yeah, we, no, we, I mean, a, like, we have a very standard, very nice light set up on you today. Sure, sure. But, but, but also, like, uh, uh, you know, everything from uh, establishing... Uh, like, right now, we just have gels taped over uh, lights in the back, and it seems like we would be able to have stuff that would be configurable with LEDs that could swap and, uh, uh, you know, more uh, precise halos and uh, fill lights underneath and all that stuff, uh, which is all above my pay grade. But uh, I, I feel like the uh, there, we have lots of space, but we need to light everything to sort of reflect that and to bring out uh, the most of that. Yeah. Right now what we're doing is basically recreating uh, – what we had at the other place, which was our decision, because we wanted to start with what was familiar and then be able to grow out from there. Oh, totally. And I, I think that, that yeah, lighting uh, is something that you're going to eventually look into. I think uh, uh, portraying a bigger, like, space, you know, being tight when you need to be tight, but then being able to demonstrate the the uh, uh, room that you have to work with is certainly going to be a part of that. But, uh, you know, right now, I think your biggest, your next step is figuring out exactly what you want to do with that space, right? Like, or at least like for a year, like just drawing, you know, let, letting down tape and saying like, all right, this is going to be podcast space. And we want to make sure that we have that big enough for things that were like cramped, but now we can draw a solution from scratch from for like, all right, what if four people are there? What if five people are there? Right. What if we have an audience of four people, ten what, people? What if we right? want to do like, something that reads like a television, late night television style interview with, with somebody as a guest and they're being interviewed and so on? Exactly. What if, I mean, is, uh, do you want to go with, uh, uh, you know, TV head in the box so there is like a physical set that everybody's being brought into and, and the remote folks are there that we can always, you know, fade from that to our actual shot. But I mean, these are the questions that, uh, you know, to, to be honest, it's like now I know, you know, when, when, when you find yourself out getting lunch at, you know, some of the places around your, your house and you look up and you see all the, uh, especially midday, if you're at a sports bar, the only thing that they're showing are radio simulcasts on television. And the good news is 
that now there's a lot of people that have been paid a lot of money to do a lot of work to solve exactly the problem, or not the problem, but the ability to build up an audio first medium into something visually dynamic. And uh, that's, uh, you know, look, there, there's, there's a lot there. You know, there's a lot that you, gotta, that, that, uh, you have an opportunity to figure out now. Yeah, and I think a lot of that will come out of, you know, us sitting down and, and talking off off air about what which of those things is important to us. Because I mean, if I had my druthers, uh, hey, this is working just fine. Um, but I know there there's it's a lot of space, and we can do a lot of stuff with it. Um, and and it would be good to to take advantage of it as as much as we can, um, while also trying to be economical about it and and working with the technology we've got certainly like like to bryce's point having a clear idea of what you want to do next is you can bring in a lighting designer they can set up something for you and you can pay for that but then where you want to grow next and what you want to do it may or not be that mm -hmm. you know like do you want to do a green screen setup next do you want to do a you know you know, a table interview set or something like that. I think having, if you know specifically what you want to do next, then it makes sense. But, you know, otherwise you're going to have to have somebody redo it every time. It is, it is amazing to me how much uh, the perception of value with a green screen has changed over the last 10 or 12 years. Because I remember when I first went to Revision 3, that was a big selling point. Like, look at this, we have a green screen and, and nothing screamed high production quality like a uh, green screen. And now it means, oh, you're in your parents' basement and you're playing uh, games on Twitch. Uh, so, uh, well, well, when done poorly. Well, but, but regardless of whether it's done poorly or not, it, um, it, it doesn't convey the social proof of like, there are certain sets like you look at those at those uh, daytime sports shows, there are certain yeah. sets. Like you look at Sports Nation, you can't do that on a green green screen, right? It's it's like that is well, money being spent. Ah, but 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 uh, uh, around the horn, which is a huge part of ESPN's block, like is fifty fifty like green screen physical set. They they've got you know the probably they're the biggest that I've seen where it's very obviously based on the fact that they have these, what used to be physical uh, monitor casings, and now they kind of float around and shuffle and disappear and everything. Like, there, there are, uh, uh, I think, yes, now there, it, it is so, um, it, it, is, it is so prevalent that you certainly have more of a proliferation of low-end green screen. But at the high end, it's insane. Mm. It's, it's, well, it's amazing. Yeah, and the, the reason you would see on ESPN shows and stuff they would they would use physical sets because the cameras were moving. You know, when they had when they weren't doing lockdown shots and the cameras were moving, that's when you use the physical set. Because back then, trying to do a tracking green screen shot for a live thing was just not practical. Now it is, and so you see the hybrid sets and like you know most of what you do, your cameras aren't moving, and so it's it's you could be in a green screen for all I know right now. Um, so, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, th I think, you know, look, there's there's a lot that you can do there, even if you look at like, OK, do we want to have different sets? Like, do we want to be able to go? Are we shooting uh, two shot modern rogue episodes that you're effectively going to shoot on that set? Right. Uh, but do you want that to be on the BB logo with the same thing as Night Attack? Do you want weird things to be on the same set as Night Attack? There's just a lot of really cool options that you have right now. And, and I would say for the next couple weeks, like number one, get the trauma of moving and like everything kind of getting settled for now out of the way. And, and then start to look at like, Ooh, you want to know what would be cool is if we did X, Y, or Z and let some of the, the demands of the shows that you're doing sort of dictate that. Like tonight, you guys are going to do the, the movie draft with Mike TV. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, because you used to just be in a, tiny room, Mike TV would just sit right next to Brian and play his songs. Does Mike TV or musical gets, is that worth getting another set right now? So you've set him up yeah. on, 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 on a black screen here. Yeah. Like is, is there a more permanent version of that? Is there another, uh, uh you know, what do you want to do to build that out? Like that's, that's the kind of stuff that I think is going to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I'm excited to see what you guys do. And, and 
one of my favorite things was remember watching Letterman back in the early days and they're like how he would figure out how do we use this stay on stage? How do we use this thing in a different way? And maybe they'll be on the roof dropping water balloons, you know, or maybe we're gonna put our own little cheapo camera to fly over the head. I mean, it just I think I think there's a lot of neat things that once you just start saying you get to do it however you want. Yeah, and I think uh, back to kind of the core uh, things we talk about on After Things, um, it's better to just hit the ground running and start doing and then note as you go along, like, oh, it'd be nice if we had this. Oh, we, you know, down the road should uh, take care of this. Here's a problem that we didn't realize w would be happening often. But all of that begins not by sitting down and imagining the perfect version of everything, but by actually getting started. And as we all know, oftentimes the thing that you're convinced will be a big problem turns out not to be a big problem. And the thing that you never even considered turns out that's the one that you really have to address. Though, so you I, know what? I think we're, we're in such open waters that it, it wouldn't hurt to, to, to have a little bit more of a heading in, in that way. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, but again, you need to know, you need to know kind of the shape of it. And like right now, like literally today is the first time that you guys are really getting the shape of, and you're gonna tonight get the shape of like, okay, what is this with Mike on another set? What is this with Brian right here? Uh, uh, you've already troubleshot two or three different things with audio. Uh, uh, as you kind of run through a week, maybe two of that and can process like, okay, going forward, What's the coolest thing we can do? How do we make this look even better? How do we how do we bring up those production values? And that's where, uh, and I think to Andrew's point, like when you get to the idea of like, oh, okay, well, really, no matter what, no matter how close we put these gel lights, where or, or how how we angle them, we're only going to be able to get X level of lighting. Where if we did get a super pro lighting rig. Uh, now, A, the setup's going to be faster, it's going to be a lot more dynamic, and we just have other options to it. Like, that's that's where those decisions, uh, uh, I think, are are appropriate. We live in a really exciting age, just with the way, like, light panels are so cheap now. Like, I had a, you know, last night I needed to do a little side light, and I had, like, a $30 like, light panel that I bought the same exact thing 12 years ago for, like, $1,000. And you know, the ability to light stuff inexpensively and, you know, leave these things up longer is great, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's even, that's just a ring light and then some specialty light on the other side, but, like, I had another little small light panel brick, and so, like, you have the big panels, things like that, you, you can go buy, you know, you've already got some great stuff there, so that's the cool thing is, it's just, and, you know, some C-stands and some light panels, you can do a lot of things and figure out what you like and then figure out how to make it permanent, Yeah. but you guys know what you're doing. So I'm excited. I'm just really excited to see what happens out of there. Mm -hmm. It's like the children's television workshop, but for like older delinquents or something. <laughs> the older delinquents workshop. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, man, like I'm a sucker. Like I, I am. There's like I'm like, ah, you know, I, I think about everything I consume and I do and I put a tip attention to it. But then you hit a couple triggers and all of a sudden somebody just addresses some sort of thing and. I'm like already clicking buy and I heard about a company and I first I heard the name of the company is listen to some tech show they're talking about it I didn't know what they were and once they described what they did I'm like within a minute buying this okay you're like Andrew what did you buy um I bought cereal for magic spoon you heard about this no so who who here like still likes breakfast cereal I mean, I do when I allow myself to have it. It's straight so up forgetting sugar. the calories inside, do you like it? Forgetting oh, the calories. Are you kidding like, me? Cocoa yeah, Dynabites yeah. for the win. Yeah. So Magic Spoon was like some adults who said, hey, we like cereal, but maybe we could re-engineer cereal. Maybe we could make it healthy. Maybe we could add the protein. Maybe we could lower the sugar, but maybe we can give you the same flavor that you had when you were a kid. I have no idea if it's good or not. I have no idea. I get some in a couple days. But the fact that some people said... Cause like I would get cereal like you, Brian, but I'm like ah, I don't, I can't justify sitting there eating, you know, a bowl of you know cinnamon cr toast crunch, because it's just sugar on flour. But apparently, 
They've got a lower calorie cereal that's nutritious for you, much like Soylent or whatever. These people said we're going to try to re-engineer cereal for adults, wow. and they have flavors like so. For, fruity, for the like, sweetener, like, are they doing like sucralose in there, or what are they doing to? There, I forget which one they're doing. Bryce, you can see the sweetener. They're using some other natural sort of sweetener that's got a lower calorie content but tastes really good and. That says so. low sugar, nothing artificial. Oh, uh, here we go. Milk protein blend, coconut oil, natural sweetener blend with monk fruit, stevia, and allulose. Uh, tapioca flour, chicory root fiber, natural flavors, and salt. Huh. How many how many calories? Do they do a comparison of like your, your yeah, they have Lucky the Charms calorie versus? Uh, 111 calories. 12 per grams bowl. of protein. So yeah, do you have the, the chart there? Um, uh, I, uh, we've got nutritional facts here. Yeah, there's a chart somewhere on there. Uh, yeah, there you go. And they do a comparison, I think, the us versus them, too. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so anyhow. Huh. Well, the... Uh, here we uh, go. So proteins, very high in protein, very low in carbs uh, compared to... Uh, both the fruitier and, and, and sweeter cereals, as well as things like Frosted Flakes or Special K with protein. Huh. Brian, as like a as a food guy, does this how does this work? Yeah, well, uh, I don't know how much value I put on grain free or gluten free, but uh, sure. certainly protein over carbs is is uh, is good news. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll buy that. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll. In fact, I'll literally buy it. I'll, I too will join your uh, your experiment. Because <laughs> we have this desire for cereal, but we won't let ourselves have it because of that. We look at the back of the label, and we go, ah. And so, I, I and I brought this up because, like, I my problem had been I like cereal, but I do not eat cereal because because of that. And these people went out there, and we'll see if it's good. It's more way more expensive than regular cereal, but. You know, I I love the fact that they looked at a desire and a need, and it's a simple one. Adults who want to eat breakfast cereal and then said, well, we can solve that, or we think we have a solution for it. You know, who we're not telling anybody else to buy this. We have no idea if it's good or not. We'll give you an update on that. But for talking to creatives and people out there looking to solve a problem, this was – I heard about this on a tech show. Is this tech? Well, it's food tech. You know, it's food tech, and it's – yeah. You know, some people sitting down and figuring out how do we do this? And, you know, you look at how Soylent came out and Soylent, you know, the story of Gatorade is amazing because it's like, you know, university trying to come up with a perfect drink. But then Soylent was just sort of like, you know, some dudes like, man, I don't want to go out and get food. I want a simple solution. Now it's a big brand. And now we've got Magic Spoon, which is, you know, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, it's you know, I mean, it, it also is just. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that it, it's just kind of amazing how uh, uh, stuff like this can come to market so fast. And the Internet disrupted all kind of supply stuff to the point where there is now such a market that literally, you know, Andrew can hear it on a podcast and buy it and then talk about it on a podcast. And now Brian's buying it. Whereas before, if you were going to do all the R&D and all the sourcing and all the branding and, and everything that would go into making something like that before, it would be like, ah, I mean, are we going to be able to battle General Mills for like space in grocery stores? Are we going to have to get a small order first to fund us? Like we're looking at a, a six year run up period and that's if we sell really well. Uh, but now it's like, hey, look, we're doing cereal. Buy it on the Internet. It's just I mean, I know that's kind of a redundant uh, uh you know, point, but it's kind of amazing. There is there is one uh, eyebrow raising moment, and that's when I go to click on Coco, and it says quantity one thirty nine dollars. Very expensive, it seems. <laughs> but I think you're buying four boxes at once. Yeah, no, it does. It does say a dollar thirty nine per bowl. That's still ten dollars a box of cereal. That's uh, yeah. that's that's uh, that's some cash. That's but some cash. It is, it is a is a new thing. It's trying to be a good thing. So I I under, like I think if it's going to be online only, if it's you know not on grocery stores, if it's not having to fight for shelf space. Man, I was going to get. get it, I wanted to get the cocoa and the and the cinnamon. Now all of a sudden I'm in for a hundred dollars. <laughs> get the variety. They got a four pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, I, yeah, then yeah, I, I have to get the fruity one. I don't I'll want take the, the fruity, fruity one. one. No. <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe I can pawn off the fruity one on the kids. Hmm. Bryce just asked for the fruity yeah, one. Yeah, why are you denying <laughs> Bryce the Come fruity on. one? Well, I was like, right. I'll eat the fruity one. Brian's like, maybe I could. Ki- maybe the raccoon's <laughs> in the back. I didn't yeah. hear. I didn't hear <laughs> because because Bryce is not on the monitor, so, oh, I, so I didn't no, know he so said that. No, I'd, I'd take it. Uh, <laughs> I do like that they have basically boiled down all cereals to the four flavors of cinnamon, frosted, fruity, and cocoa. No, no marshmallow though. They need a marshmallow. They need a marshmallow. Well, well it's pretty hard to do protein marshmallows. <laughs> they, they can be <laughs> considering sugar. just straight up sugar. <laughs> Why we say that? But we don't. There could be a. I, you know, I go. I eat it like I eat vegan or vegetarian a couple times a week because. They do pretty good. Like I had a buffalo chicken sandwich that was with chicken with the, the ends with a K or whatever it is. I don't know what it was. It was good though. Somebody could come up with a marshmallow. Bryce could come up with the marshmallow. Yeah, Yo, get on uh, that, Bryce. Uh, yeah. What are you doing? We're in the studio. Man, we needed a protein marshmallow. <laughs> all right, take here from, I just ordered take it from some. Somebody who who eats with a vegan all the time. Buffalo chicken is pretty good in the vegan world because buffalo sauce is effectively vegan. And uh, uh, the fake chicken, which is not my favorite of the like replacement meats, the one thing that it is is so spongy that it just like sops up every. If you like buffalo sauce, like vegan stuff with that is pretty good. Yeah. So, anyhow, I brought this up because as the point I said earlier is that hey, like you know, we we often we're looking for opportunities and things we can go do, and food tech is a very interesting area. And I, we could be in a universe where another five years went by or 10 years went by where nobody even bothered thinking about, well, how do I re-engineer children's breakfast cereal? We'll see if Magic Spoon works or not. I know if this works and I don't feel like I'm putting on weight, like I see myself probably buying a lot of this stuff because I have the taste palate of a 10-year-old. Yeah, I, I believe, uh, I, I'm going to bet it will taste pretty good because when I was doing the weight training, I would do those um, uh, kind of vanilla-flavored protein shakes. And I know everybody likes to wrinkle their nose at protein shakes, but uh, it tasted like candy to me, like a, mm-hmm. like a milkshake. Yeah, I would even, like Soylent, sometimes I'd mix a little bit of the like artificial sweetener in there that added like maybe five calories to it, and it was like a treat. You know, it was like, mm, it was like a milkshake. Mm, lucky me, you know. So, um, I don't know. I just thought that was, hey, novel and cool. So, any picks? Yeah, I got a pick. Hey, I saw the movie Hustlers over the weekend. Uh, y'all know about this movie, Hustlers? Nope. Yep. Yeah, it's got uh, uh, J-Lo and Cardi B's in it, right? So Cardi B and Lizzo are, are I think they're, they're, they're in it for the legally appropriate amount of time to be put on the poster and have them Instagram about it. <laughs> uh, they're, uh, basically, it is a movie version of an article called Hustlers at Scores, or The Hustlers at Scores, which came out a few years ago, and it was about a group of women who were former strippers that began... Uh, taking men, uh, meeting men at bars, drugging them, taking them to strip clubs where they got a cut, uh, running up their credit cards almost to maximum, uh, and then putting them in a cab and having them go home. And even though the plan eventually falls through, uh, there were so few men that would uh, would, uh, admit to it that they wound up getting away with it for a comically long amount of time. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the, the movie's good. Uh, it, it is a fairly straight-ahead kind of gangster tale told from uh, a perspective you don't normally hear about. Uh, J-Lo is... It's, it's one of those, like, star performances. Like, you don't know if it's the most challenging acting in the world, but you know every time she shows up on screen, uh, uh, it means something. And Constance Wu who was last, uh, I think her biggest role prior to this was in Crazy Rich Asians, where I thought she was a cardboard cutout. Uh, she's good in this. Uh, uh, this she's, she's really the main character, and uh, uh, you, you, you kind of see an arc there. I will say, after seeing the movie, I read the article, and eh, they kind of, they sand some edges uh, to, to, to the plan. They, this could have been a far darker movie than it than it winds up being and although they don't 
really pull any any punches on whether or not the girls are are doing a bad thing. There certainly is a few. There are a few details that if they had put it into the movie, you'd be like, oh, wow, these these women are like bad, bad for reasons that that uh, uh, kind of go beyond getting back at, you know, these Wall Street guys. Yeah, that was the I knew about the backstory and then I saw the trailer and like, oh, these Wall Street guys. And I'm like, uh, this is you're having one group of awful people here who are maybe victimizing people who actually aren't as awful as you just said they were. Um, and it's like pain and gain where you're like, those were horrible, horrible, horrible people. And how am I going to, you know, so I'm glad you like it. But like, yeah, it's one of these things where it's like this is not this 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 from the trailer. I'm like. These were really bad people. <laughs> These were really, really awful yeah. people. And and you know, I, ironically, I think the magazine article does a better job. Although, like the exact line is in the movie to kind of explain, uh, sort of the the symbiosis that that these women kind of feel with the Wall Street uh, uh, folks. So, uh, look, I, I would say. Uh, it is not quite the moral study that <laughs> that I might want from from a, a, a something like this, but in in general, it is uh, if, if you can get around the idea that like, hey, look, this is a gangster movie. You don't watch Goodfellas and wonder whether or not they are good guys. You you are are rolling with them while they are making hor- uh, horrendous uh, decisions morally, and and I would say. Look at it like that. I I don't know if it stands up as like the like girls got to stick together girl power kind of thing that it's that it's marketed as. But I don't really think that the movie thinks that either. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, I mentioned this over in the show proper uh, weird things. But uh, Infinity Train was great. Watched all 10 episodes of it. Uh, they're available uh, I don't know. I think I watched them on demand uh, through the Cartoon Network app. Uh, it was only ten episodes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's very short. I That's watched uh, the, the whole thing in one like maybe three hours or so. Um, it, it was adorable, and then got surprisingly in depth. Like there's a whole episode that's only about the thirteen year old kid revisiting various versions of her memory of when her parents told her they were getting a divorce, mm. and uh, and it, it's very believable and. Um, uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Highly recommended. Infinity Train. Yeah. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, I got another Apple Arcade pick. Um, Go! Uh, this really interesting game called Over the Alps. Uh, it is a story-based game that takes place all via postcards. So you're uh, in uh, in Switzerland in the, in the, the 30s, right on the eve of World War II, and you are an English spy, and you don't quite know why you're there, and you don't even really get a good explanation of how the game works or why, but you're taken through these these written prompts, and then you're given different like ways that you can handle any scene. So uh, there are like these stamps, and so like the little cat stamp is like if you want to be the sly person, uh, you can. Uh, there's a disguise one if you want to be. Uh, a little sneakier. You can there's a there's a hatchet if you want to be the real like aggressive kind of guy. Uh, it's it's neat. It's it's a really neat game, and there are not a lot of games that could do a narrative game like this where they don't tell you the mechanics of the game um, that you are successful in the way that this is. Plus, it, it it really is gorgeous. All of the different little set pieces that they that each little town or village is in. Uh, they're really nice. They it, when you move your phone. It's like a Wes around, Anderson game. Yeah, because they're all styled like travel posters, almost like with the the very you know uh, basic uh, coloring and all. Uh, and when you move your phone around, like the backgrounds shift and all, so it's like you're actually looking in a little diorama. The uh, uh, the art style is reminiscent of uh, those Google Doodles. This yeah. this kind of stylized thing. Yeah. Uh, so th- it's it's really cool, um, very easy to play. Uh, just read and you pick, you make choices, uh, and it has a lot of like detail in it. It knows, you know, when if you if you got a gun, if you've been captured by the police before, you know, uh, who you make friends and enemies with. Uh, so that's over the Alps. I think it's only on Apple Arcade right now, um, but uh, check it out. Very very cool game. I- 
I, I, I'm, I'm in love with, you know, the idea of creating platforms to make it easier for, I mean, you have that, we have like Steam and stuff are great, but discoverability is a problem. And you have like, there are some such amazing game developers and people out there just, just doing wonderful, wonderful things. It's hard to get a bigger platform and get attention to stuff. And I love that like a thing like this gets to exist and be there. And, and, and you kind of, you sit there and you think about like, as games become a bigger part of our life and the, what a, a game means going beyond just a first person shooter and stuff, you know, I'm just thinking like, what is it going to be like 80 years from now? You know, is, is, is going completing the eighth grade going to be like, you know, you're going to do, you know, some version of call of duty and you're going to do some other, like, you know, four different games kind I'll of thing. I'll tell you what, got- man, uh, highly recommended my kid. Uh, you know what? Forget my other pick. This is my real pick. My six-year-old started playing this game for class called Prodigy, and uh, I got sucked in watching that thing, man. It's a full-on, uh, looks like Final Fantasy, right down to uh, the, the type of gameplay. The only thing it does is add in when you cast your spell, you just have to do a real quick math problem to, to get it to happen. But, like, she starts off as this little uh, blonde-haired little girl uh, whatever the name of the character was. I come back six hours later. She's got like badass armor. She's got a flaming sword wa- f- traveling on a floating cloud and stuff. It's a, uh, it's fantastic, man. Highly recommended. Oh, so oh like that's a, wonderful. I'm re- educational. Mapping. Years ago, we talked about huh. what's that? Uh, no, no, go ahead. We, we talked about dragon eggs, which is a game that taught algebra and it's fun. Oh, uh, it the dragon really, box. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Dragon box. Yeah. And that's just, you know, now, now, seeing where we are now. And that's exciting. The problem is, you know, you're going to get, I've seen a lot, and we've all seen a lot of really crap educational games and stuff, a lot of real crap. And that's been, that's been one of the biggest detriments is that anybody with, you know, Unity or whatever and who could talk to an educator or some school system could come up with something and say we made a thing. And having that standard of knowing what's good or what's bad, and it's, and it's been holding back the exceptional and, and neat. And so... I'm I'm overall excited because I think we're going to reach a point of just super fast acceleration of really coming up with great stuff. Yeah, I, uh, all individually, every member of the family got hypnotized just watching Callie play this game, and each of us, you know, said we wish that we had it when we were younger. She spent the whole weekend long doing math and loving it. I mean, wow. it was it was remarkable. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, my pick um, again. I'll double down to just Apple Arcade. Cool, but. Uh, any of you been watching Carnival Row? Mm-mm. No. Mm-mm. This is a new Amazon show, right? I see ads for it. Amazon series stars uh, Orlando Bloom and uh, Cara Delevingne. Um, and, the, and the premise is that it's this alternate timeline, alternate world, but it feels a lot like maybe late 1800s you know, or 1900s sort of. Uh, our, our timeline. But the, in this world, there was this other land where fairies and uh, centaurs and all these other creatures were real, and then we find it, and then we fight, you know, basically there's the, the, we fight different groups, fight over for control of this land, and then basically one group that loses control, the people from a place called the, the, the Burge lose, and they go back to like what kind of feels like England, and then, but there's some immigration of, of fairies and pixies and other people from this land to there, and they're treated like second class citizens. And it's sort of set in this very, very well thought out world. You know, Orlando Bloom plays a guy who was a, uh, he was a soldier over in this war, came back, and now he's a police investigator who does a lot of, investigates a lot of crimes involving, you know, the pixie people or critch is what they call these creatures. And so part of it tells stories, you know, taking place in, that time period but then they have flashbacks to the to the war he fought in etc it is extremely well developed world um i was hesitant to get into it because a lot of time like, fantasy stuff can be hit or miss as you the visuals are great and the story sort of sucks i read some criticisms of people like what's it about whatever like i don't know it, it doesn't have like a big grand game of thrones sort of thing right now it's more sort of on a smaller scale there is a big mystery being revealed, and there's power players involved, but it's really a lot about their relationship and this sort of world building. I'm enjoying it. I'm like halfway through, four episodes in, and I'm I'm really enjoying this. And I thought I would be the last person to like it. Cool. So, Carnival Row. Cool. Uh, big congrats on the studio, guys. That is a lot of work. That is a lot of work. And I am very, very impressed by what you've done. 
Yeah. Dude, know. we're excited. Uh, yeah, the the story will continue to unfold. Hmm. Yeah. I'm a guy that can't even find an HDMI cable on my desk here. So <laughs> <laughs> don't look at what you've done there. I'm like, you know, I feel like, you know, I don't know, like how some Pacific Islander must have felt when, like, you know, a big battleship showed up or something like this, you know, like, uh, how is this how possible? So <laughs> cool. It's been after. Wow. You. OK, there we go. Hey, good work, everybody. Right on, man. Successful launch. We hey, did it. We did it. Yay. Uh, righty. We're going to uh, go off there. Get ready for cord killers. Mm, yeah. You've got to get a hold of yourself. <laughs> We're going to have. Uh, all right, guys. All right. Uh, Later. Thank nope. you all. All right. See you guys. We're going to have uh, cord killers in a little bit. Movie draft this evening. Uh, until then. See you guys later.